Very welcome, everyone. We're so we're so excited to to have you everyone here, um, and we're asking to um, if you can just say a hello, share where you're connecting from. Uh, well, when we when when we organize where we are we're organizing this this event, we even have a, had a because we're from different parts of the world, and this is so this is so nice. So we had a sort of a small challenge to find like the good time to be all together, wasn't it? <laughs> so I, I hope it fit your your time as well. Oh, uh, hello, Samar from Kuwait. Yeah, Samar's from here, Kuwait, from Kuwait. Kuwait. Give me the high sign when you want to start, everybody. Now, okay, Mariana. Mariana says we're going to start. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first Biotensegrity Interest Group for physical therapists or phys in physiotherapy. This is an event invited by the Biotensegrity Archive, which you'll hear more about today. And it's created by physiotherapists, for physiotherapists, with many others, 175 other interested guests invited to join us. My name is Carol Davis. I'm a physical therapist from Portland, Maine, or south of Portland, Scarborough, Maine. And I'm speaking for a faculty of physical therapists and Pedro. Pedro is a biologist psychologist who joins us in our efforts, um, who created this program. And they include Mariana Barreto from Toronto, Stacy Bar Barros from California, Eileen Dickinson from Michigan in the USA, Kutu or Maria Jose Gomez from Duluth, which you'll, or from, sorry, from Dublin, who you will hear from, uh, Pedro Ferreira from uh, Brazil, Bruna Petito from Brazil and Chicago, uh, Kimi Hasegawa from Vermont, Camila Morkova from the Czech Republic, and Fernando Tejera from Spain. So special thanks to all of them. And also special recognition and thanks to Dr. Stephen Levin, the founder of Biotensegrity, and Susan Lowell de Solorzano, a special colleague and advisor for today, and Chris Clancy for all of her work in helping us also. So welcome everyone. And um, we have a full day ahead. So I'll just really review the program real quickly with you so that you know how we're going to unfold over these next few hours. Um, first off, we're going to have um, Camilla, Markova, Eileen Dickinson, and, and Kutu Maria Gomez Sanchez talking to you about uh, the mandala and short clinical cases until 1130. And then Fernando will present his first presentation, the first presentation, uh, classic biomechanics versus tensegrity informed bio tens uh, biomechanics. That's from 1130 to 1230. From 1230 to 130, Mariana is going to present her case, and that is how biotensegrity transformed my assessment of the hips in patients with cerebral palsy. At 1.30, these are all Eastern time, of course, we're going to have a bio break until 1.40, and then Bruna will come join us for a movement exercise, how bio how biotensegrity informs the communication of movement practices. That's 140 to two. And then from two to three, Stacy joins us to say what I thought I knew about biotensegrity. Um, and then from three to four, we have an open discussion where we uh, talk about the challenges of early adapters of this new science in our practice and a group discussion about questions that you have for today and, um, and, what, um, and what other things are still dangling. Each of the presentations of the three major presentations will be about 30 to 40 minutes long, and then you'll be able to ask questions of the presenter. So um, please jot down your questions so that you can remember them and we will open it up for discussion. When people are presenting, it's probably most helpful for the bandwidth if you will turn off your video and of course mute yourselves until we open it up for open discussion. And that will make this recording, I think, a little bit easier as well. So without further ado, 
welcome everybody. And I'm going to turn it over to Camilla and Eileen and Kutu for the first presentation. Camilla, would you like to come first and present what you, what we will play? Where's Camila? Oh, there you are. You're muted. Hold on, hold on. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I was forbidden to talk. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, Mariana will play a video that uh, we prepared for you. It's going to be... Okay, now we can admit people here also. It's distracting. So... Uh, Mariana will play a video about the Armandala that we came up with. Uh, it was originally Chris Clancy's idea and we worked on it. Uh, so it's a bit uh, more PT friendly. And we hope this will give you some nice introduction to what we are actually talking about and so excited about. So Mariana, please share it. Thank you. build. We have been using heart matter physics to build our homes. Hello everyone. We have created this video to get a small and hopefully fun overview of what is going on when Diana we talk Bruce. about the paradigm wow. shift. Maybe you can in order that... to see the bigger picture of what we would like to share. We will use this mandala the lower half stands for our base, for what we mostly learned in our training in biomechanics. The upper half stands for a different paradigm we may possibly get curious to explore some more later on, biotensegrity. Now, let's have a look on the left side of the lower part of the mandala and talk a bit about the environment we grew up in and how we actually built it. For as long as we can remember, we have been using mostly straight lines, right angles, and continuous compression to build. We have been using hard matter physics to build our homes and cities, and that way, little by little, we have replaced the shapes of the natural environment we originally lived in. In 17th century, Descartes articulated the separation of the mind and the body. At least, that is mostly how we understood it. The body was just a tool that served us. Over time, we got also very good in creating inventions that made life easier on our bodies, and we got comfortable in the world of hard matter. A big support of that was the Industrial Revolution. It makes sense that we started to see our body from a perspective we could understand as a heart matter mechanism, as a machine. Let's give ourselves a moment now to imagine how it would feel to move like a machine. What is the quality of movement we need to find in order to move like a mechanism? Give yourself a couple of seconds and feel it in your body when you have this image in front of you, how you would move as a machine. When we look at the picture of the small robot here, we can see it consists of parts that are clearly divided. If something gets broken and we have the manual we know exactly what to do in order to fix it. We can also rely on the manual to tell us what to do if some other robot or machine get broken, because all of them are alike and they have the same parts. Based on this model in practice, we physiotherapists then come into action to save the day 
and it is completely in our hands to repair and correct what is broken. The responsibility for the outcome is also fully on our side. The way human dissections were done during centuries also supported us in understanding the body as a collection of parts and pieces. In the world where things held together by continuous compression or some mechanism, it was only natural that we started to see the bones as levers and the muscles as pulleys. It made sense to describe movement in planes, to follow the straight lines, to see the spine as a column and breathing as a complicated piston mechanism. We have formed a very linear understanding of the body based on the heart matter physics something that we can measure, predict, and understand well. Can you actually think about what we need to do with a person's body in order to measure a range of movement of a joint in one specific plane? What we need to do in order to place our goniometer to measure that angle? And how can our approach change if we consider human body as a living organism? Before we move on to the other half of the mandala, I would like to ask you to open your mind. Susan Lowell de Solorzano talks beautifully about the importance of beginner's mind. In order to be able to absorb something new, we first need to let go of our current ideas and opinions of what we know already. To keep ourselves open to new possibilities, we need to become curious. Moving further on, I invite us to put our knowledge to the side for a little while and let's continue from a perspective of not knowing. Here we have a picture of Buckminster Fuller's geodesic dome and the Tensegrity icosahedron. This way of building uses different principles. These structures don't depend on gravity to keep their shape. They hold together because of the forces of push and pull, the continuous tension and discontinuous compression. The struts are held in their place thanks to the tensional webbing. They float in the sea of tension. In order to understand what tensegrity has to offer, it is crucial to make a model. Then you can feel with your hands how the tension distribution influences the shape and buoyance of the structure. How when one thing moves, everything moves. Tensegrity allows us to study the whole. So when we understand the science of how these principles work, can it help us understand what we experience in our clinical practice? Like what happens when we touch a patient or how we can see changes in a different area of the body than the one we are touching or moving? Or why the cause of a symptom is usually somewhere far from the symptom. Can these principles give us an explanation of how trees hold their long, heavy branches and stay bent or in a seemingly collapsed shape for years? Or how birds keep themselves up in the air? Biotensecurity can be applied to anything living. As Dr. Levin says, from viruses to vertebrates. Through this lens, we consider humans as nature. We are nature. And what is really amazing about nature is that it always does things in the most efficient way. Nature does not waste energy. It always 
has a very good reason for the way it behaves. So what would change with our understanding of human body as nature? Is there something to be fixed or can we maybe approach it with a bigger nose mind and instead of the need to know how to repair things, try to understand why it behaves the way it does? And how can that change our approach in therapy? How does that change our interaction with the human body, with the actual patient, or even with each other and ourselves? In the beginning, there is a self. And in about 10 months, there is a grown human. So what happens? No one came and put our parts together as it happens with a machine. We became on our own. When something is built by someone else, it usually also needs someone to repair it when it gets broken or does not function well. But how does that work with nature, with organisms? We are self-assembling self-organizing, ever-changing, dynamic, efficient systems. Our structure is made of soft matter, and that applies both when we were a bunch of cells and when we are already a human. Everything in our body is soft matter. The fact that we divided our internal structures and gave them names that no, does not change that we are one whole system. So when we want to scientifically understand what is going on, we simply can't use Newtonian hard matter physics. Taking a closer look at our structure, we can see various patterns that are repeating themselves in nature in different forms and on different scales. For example, what do you see when you take a very close look at your skin? Preferably check the top of your hand. And when you go out to nature, what patterns can you find there? Obviously, we will not find a tensegrity model in our body. It only serves us to illustrate the principles, the behavior, the geometry, the forces distribution in the system. And that goes from the micro scale as within the cell nucleus to the macro scale as in larger shapes and structures. Looking at the human body here, being all upside down in the gravity, biodensegrity can bring us some new understanding. When it comes to movement, Instead of straight lines, planes, and linearity, we can start paying attention to spirals and omnidirectional movement, oxyticity, closed kinematic chains, explaining to us how movement can happen in one area of the body and at the same time in another. We can be more curious about observing the shape of the body, its space distribution, and its volume instead of focusing on parts and pieces. We can learn to pay attention to the forces distribution within the system. This mandala shows us some of the main principles and topics we explore in biotensegrity. We hope it sparks your curiosity and bring some more questions into our practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Camila. That was beautiful, as always. Uh, my name is Eileen Dickinson. I'm a mostly retired uh, physical therapist who continues to see people um, of my own choosing <laughs> and those who seek the unique uh, combination of my offerings. 
I have a private practice in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and have transitioned to being primarily a practitioner of Traeger and an instructor in foundation training, as well as teaching science online to body workers. In my own personal as well as professional journey, I eventually reached a point where I was not willing to do isolated specific exercises that were taken out of the context of the whole body. Practicing yoga is what first enlightened me in this regard 30 years ago, and more recently foundation training, which is now my preferred whole body corrective exercise. And I'd like to share with you a case example um, of this. So a 35-year-old male came to me a couple months ago, and he was already experiencing persistent long low back pain with a recurrent left lateral shift that was very difficult to correct by physical therapists, numerous physical therapists, and osteopaths. And he was never able to correct it on his own. He was very frustrated because He's a golfer and he works out uh, weightlifting with a personal trainer. And both of those activities were uh, no longer possible. Needless to say, he was quite motivated to change his situation. I should say that he doesn't sit much. He's, he works remotely um, and uses a standing desk most of the time. So in my uh, pre-biotensegrity professional life, I would have intervened in the usual fixing mode that Camila mentioned. I might have used traction if I was in a clinic or employed the McKenzie method or muscle energy technique. What else? You probably have a lot of things to add to that category. And maybe I would have given him a home program of correcting his shift at the wall. But really, what is the long-term success of all this? He was uh, a living proof that there isn't long-term uh, success with these methods that are used in isolation of the whole body. So a biotensegrity informed approach to working with him would take a whole body perspective and working with the dysfunction, but only in the context of the whole. And having the practitioner be the instigator or the facilitator and allowing the wisdom of the body to reconfigure itself into its most efficient way of being. <clears throat> so first of all, just a couple of concepts uh, about foundation training. It involves anchoring, and anchoring is from the pelvis to the floor. <clears throat> Decompression is mostly from the pelvis up. And then integration is using the body-wide tensional network. So when this fellow ar arrived, and I, excuse me, and I, um, uh, went over foundation training with him. I had him do this one um, exercise called supine decompression. It involves anchoring from the pelvis down with this configuration, doing something called decompression breathing, where you expand uh, omnidirectionally in the rib cage and then maintain as much of that expansion as you can on the exhale. And then uh, allowing the arms to be in various positions to integrate that. So he, um, let me go back here um, if I can. He did this particular exercise, repeating it or holding it for four big breaths. And then he stood up and his 
lateral shift was corrected, just like that. He was flabbergasted, to say the least. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, I was seeing him once a week, he would say that every time he sat, even for like a meal, the lateral shift would recur. And he would stand up and do a standing foundation training exercise, and it would resolve itself. So he was very empowered um, that he could manage this on his own. And that went on for a couple of weeks. And ever since, he's had no recurrence of the lateral shift, and he hasn't had any uh, recurrence of back pain. He's back to golfing. He's back to weightlifting. He's super happy, and he's progressed um, from some of the easier foundation training exercises to ones involving rotation. Uh, and he's very helpful or uh, uh, grateful for the improvements that he's had in his golf game. So how I see biotensegrity and foundation training intersecting or about biotensegrity is the reason foundation training works is that we're lengthening under tension. And that is something that I never knew about in physical therapy because um, tension was viewed as shortening the body, but this is lengthening under tension. It's omnidirectional expansion while under tension. It's actually feeling the forces of push and pull in the body for the client. It involves the whole body. It contributes to client self-efficacy. And it relieves me as the practitioner from being the fixer and making me the facilitator, which is a role I'm so much more comfortable with. It is so much easy, easier to let go of the fixing mode. And for additional information, if foundation training is new to you, I have a few um, resources here listed. Uh, Eric Goodman is the creator of this. I should mention that in his 20s, he, he had uh, severe back pain. The MRI indicated that he needed a spinal fusion and he refused to get one and he got himself out of pain and completely functional with these exercises that he created. And he continues to evolve this work. There's a really nice streaming platform. Um, this book, True to Form, I think came out in 2016. So it's a little outdated because he's progressed. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. That was so, so good. I, I think I should have still some of your slides for, for my presentation. <laughs> it, it explains a lot. Uh, my name is Maria. I am a PT that works with animals also for my liking. Um, and I'm going to share with you um, a case that uh, taught me a lot um, about biotensegrity without knowing that that's what he was showing me, really. Um, so his name is uh, Poser. I have permission to, to, to say his name, which is great. Um, because I think he should get the credit here. Uh, he came to the referral hospital where I work um, after, um, sorry, after um, a, a surgery, a laryngeal surgery that is quite common in horses. But um, while he was recovering, he developed this, um, this curvature uh, on his neck. Um, it was very, very severe and um, um, I'm not sure if you can see it well there. Um, and um, so when he was referred to, to us, um, the surgical team and all the team um, decided to do the proper diagnosis and um, <clears throat> and they did the x-rays and they um, found out that he had a significant curvature of the facet joints on uh, CTC3 
sorry, C2, C3, C3, C4, C4, C5, which is quite very severe and extensive with a cyst like lesion uh, visible in C4, C5 uh, with marked synovitis. So that um, consequently um, led um, to, these are his x-rays for the ones that can, can read it, um, led to this um, very abnormal head carriage. Uh, he was very, very stuck. He couldn't move his head for four days. Uh, so he had to be fed with bucket uh, close to his, his, his head, um, his mouth, and, and also uh, had to offer uh, water regularly. And you can see that apart from not being able to move his head, he was also um, neurologically compromised. He was a toxic and uh, he wasn't very aware where his uh, limbs were. Maybe you can appreciate it a little bit better. Um, now, when at his turn, he hesitates um, and he had to reconfigure himself. So um, with such a severe lesion, um, the surgery team and the medical team was limited on, on the intervention. There's no surgery that can really fix that. And we knew that if we intervene too aggressively and too soon, um, it wouldn't have um, gone well from, from, for, for the spinal cord. So uh, at that point, they, um, and they, it was great that they, they allowed me <clears throat> uh, treat him um, and I didn't know biotensegrity. Uh, I didn't know the term. Uh, all I knew was um, obviously um, my, my anatomy, uh, insertions and origins and the skeletal muscle uh, and the skeletal structure. I knew about the fascia lines in a very the, uh, two-dimensional um, way. And I also started to know a little bit about the three-dimensional ability of, of, of fascia. So it's uh, interesting that sometimes it's limitation that gives us opportunities to, to learn further. So I wasn't willing to go very close to the insult area with poser because I knew the risk was very high for further uh, cord in, in, um, compression. So I decided to work um, away from, from from that side uh, and on his sternum and his wither area, which I know it's also a, a, a cranial sacral um, cradle point, um, and work with him. Um, so at the beginning, I my um, treatment plan was very anatomically based, but as soon as I put my hands on him, it turned into something else that now it, it we can uh, we have better vocabulary, but I didn't have any vocabulary then. I was guided by, <clears throat> excuse me, by his movement and by his demeanor um, <clears throat> when I was applying my 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 movements, my tension and, and compression movements. Um. So after uh, that half an hour uh, treatment, um, he was um able to move his head, not in a greater <clears throat> manner, but able to move it nonetheless. And he was able to lower his head enough to eat, which is a, a big deal in, in horses, um, obviously, because they have a, a big busy belly to, to look after. And without that, it, it wouldn't be viable for for poser um, to live. And so I thought that was amazing. Um, and so did the rest of the team, which was great uh, to have them on board. So I continued treating Poser, and these are his pictures before uh, when on presentation and after four weeks when we visited it, uh, uh, visit him at home. And uh, this was him after three months, um, able to, to manage him, himself. Um, and able to even afford uh, affording a little trot. Um, so I think the main lesson um, for me with Poser is that 
and with all animals is that they don't have any placebo um, so they're, they're unlikely to be cheating and they have no ling human language so they can't really hear what we tell them and you know um, um, I suppose follow in instructions um, verbally they have no agenda but to survive um, um, and I suppose <laughs> live happy uh, or as happy as they can they have no intellectual ego so they, they're not interested in learning how it happened um, they do react to dangerous pain showing aggression so that's a very good I suppose landmark that it would be beneficial for us human physios to uh, to follow and they give uh, honest feedback so I think it's animals serve a great opportunity for the human uh, physiotherapy so we can learn further. And um, that's me. Thank you so much. Okay, wonderful. Um, you may have some questions um, and we will handle those later. Um, but jot your questions down right now. Um, and uh, two wonderful uh, cases that illustrate the principles of biotensegrity, even though, um, as Kutu mentioned, she didn't know about biotensegrity when she was doing this, she just knew about fascia. And so now she understands a little bit more about why she was so successful so quickly, even treating farther from the lesion um, and how quickly she was able to help um, this wonderful horse establish a, an alignment of the cervical spine and then be able to functionally move the neck. Next up, Fernando Tejero from Spain is going to talk to us about his presentation. Um, and I'll let you, Fernando, introduce your presentation and yourself. Okay, thank you very much. I presume you can see my white screen. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone, wherever you are peaceful located. And um, I'm Fred. My name is Fernando. I am a physiotherapist located in Madrid. I mostly do uh, consultancy two days a week. And then the rest of the week, I'm working uh, home attendance, seeing mostly elderly people. Um, I like to thank uh, to the organizers before I start for keep on pushing this kind of events on the uh, well uh, and better understanding and application of the biotensegrity and tensegrity concept. Also to the technical team and of course the rest of the lectures. And they attend this without you. This would not have any any sense. So thank you very much all for being here today and paying the time and attention. Um, I like to talk to you about classic versus biotensegrity in Ford biomechanics, the difference biomechanics or the difference of understanding human movement under, under these two uh, uh, reasonings or way of reasoning the human movement. So as we were seeing with the um, um, uh, paradigm shift as Camila was showing us, uh, We've been taught about anatomy uh, from the from the 17th and the 16th century knowledge, which was very interesting for that time. And also um, the biomechanics, uh, it's also from that time, is based, as you know, in the, these two um, planes of working, these two dimensional uh, drawings where we are working under the levers. And well, this is not like, is it false, but this is an, an, complete, it's an incomplete understanding. And there is a better understanding to understand movement in the three dimensional way, which is made easily through the tensegrity or biotensegrity lens. So for example, here, if we are focusing on the knee, here, if we are focusing on the knee under the classic biomechanics, the knee is related with the joint underneath and the joint above. Uh, 
but if you see here in this video, Mr. Kat Santi, while he's moving, and you see you focus on the knee, the knee is linked with not only the hips and the ankle, but the rest of the structures from the system. <laughs> because if this forces a compression and tension relationship dances that allowed us to create the different uh, shapes, you know, the different volumes, the different position, positions that uh, 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 this man is doing. Um, creating this uh, stable and dynamic system that we are and being easy for us to understand, manage, and, and, and treat our patients. We have this uh, new way of uh, view that allows us to see the whole picture in the three-dimensional uh, understanding. So for going ahead, I would like to talk just a bit of definition about integrity. I highlight here whatever I consider most important. Uh, integrity is the characteristic property of a stable three-dimensional structure that it has member under tension that are contiguous and members under compressors under compression that are not. It's also a design principle that creates an internal stress that stabilizes the entire structure and apply it to musculoskeletal system is the property that I allowed some performs the efficiently in producing a volume. I like to say um, explain tensegrity as the representation of compressive and tensile forces and elements and the way they are related that allows forms to be shaped, stabilized, and mobilized. So what are the forces and elements? Well, you all know, compressive and tensile. Inside of the body, the forces could be positive, negative, attraction, repulsion, uh, acid basics, you know, all these environments that it's very, they are very interesting for the uh, living. Uh, also, the elements, for example, apply to the skeletal, uh, skeletal uh, musculoskeletal uh, system. The continuous tension members could be the um, myofascial web, and the, these continuous compression members elements will be uh, the bones. No, this is in the, uh, as I said, in the skeletal or uh, musculoskeletal view. And it's very important for me the way they are related, the way they are related between them, these compressive and tensile forces between them and between or within the environment they are in. And all this allows the forms, the volumes to be shaped, stabilized, and mobilized. Let's see an example to better understand this, mass easier an, an, an example to understand integrity is the pants or the trousers, no? Where can you find the tens tension and compression elements in the pants? Well, I can find easily the tension in the fabric, no? The fabric is working in a tensile environment and it's working as a tensile element. And I found the compression in at the bottom. And again, it's not only the bottom and the tension, but the way they are related. So this morning when I was wearing, when I was putting my pants, I need, it's not like I put just the fabric on top of the bottom. I need them to relate in a proper manner for them to work and to create again, a volume, which is the size of the pants, which is stable in the proper wrist and is dynamic also, you can move it. No? Some of you could be thinking what happens with the pants that they are not uh, using a button, that they are using a, a rope. Well, the rope, when it's making the knot, um, it creates a stitch, the proper knot creates a knot that behaves as a compression element. We are not uh, talking here about anatomy, but about functionality. So again, it's a tensile element that the way it is related with the fabric and with it itself, it creates a compressive uh, behavior element. No, again, keeping up the volume, the stability, and the dynamic because it you can mobilize. And what is missing these pants to work properly? Well, the tension compression system inside, the person inside, and again, they need to be related. The 
size of the pan need to be the same size of the of the wrist and um, also the way they are related with the environment. So if I come out with my uh, snowboarding pants on summer, well, those are not going to be the proper pants for the climate environment I'm going to get in. Here we have a picture to illustrate this. Here we have Iniesta, the football player dressed in blue, and he's in an environment, you see, and he wants to do a task, which is putting this white ball inside of the well, in the net. So Iniesta is under a situation where he's having some uh, constrictors. Also, he's having some um, affordances that allows him to create a self-organizing and come up with a pop-up response that makes happy a full uh, country. Uh, this, you can find it also in the recently researched as the complex dynamic systems. And also, it's very easy to understand this kind of view, the complex dynamic systems, while you understand the tensegrity and biotensegrity uh, concept and applications. So just to have the little glance, again, here we have the system with the task and an environment, depending on everything we have to have it in mind, the stress state, the strength, the experience, of course, the emotion. Maybe this um, presentation is, is, is very physically, but the emotions are very important in the kind of systems we are treating. And uh, of course, the task and the environment, and again, is doing a self-organization, uh, following their, uh, their beliefs, and following on uh, having in mind also the movement experience, the previously movement experience, and it comes up with a pop-up response. Here we have a video, sorry. Here we have a video that illustrates this. Sorry. You can see how this guy decide the exactly second when he need to come up with this pop-up response after doing a self-organizing when the ball was coming and he decided to pick it up. I cannot teach him. It's him, again, taking in mind all the situation. How is he doing? How is he feeling? What he wants to do? And he risked it very, very much under my understanding to release that little lady, no? But he was knowing that the foot was on top of that surface, so she wasn't getting too much risk, you know? Here we have another example about these um, complex dynamic systems and how the tensegrity is a very good understanding and um, getting in mind the whole picture. So her is going to teach us how to roll. So for example, here again, what is the, the system is, is her, of course, the task is to roll and the environment, well, we put her on top of a clean and smooth surface. We, we put next to her a toy that she would like to pick it up. So like that, she's looking, she's doing for her um, own self-organization to create that movement and to fulfill the task as it is well done. I know I would like to see you this. You know you're getting good when you are allowed or able to reverse it. What is she doing there? It's doing a stabilizing movement, it's doing like a kind of isometric there, no? In time, it will become naturally. Even though I like to take a picture after it, no? Okay, I would like you to see also this part of the video. It's very important. Remember to give yourself little rests. And as well, explore with curiosity. So, Comparing what I learned at the university and comparing what integrity could teach us. In the movement testing, for example, we've been taught about uh, seeing this linear way of thinking, how, um, what is the angle, exactly angle of each of the joints in each of the moments, but in my understanding, I'm not saying it's uh, bad, I'm saying it's kind of incomplete because like it's changing, all the measurements is changing every second, every every other second, you see? 
So it's it's good for having pictures of this um, of this task, but not to understanding the movement. No? Rather than if you understand it as a stable dynamic system, as in here, as in here, you can see a stable part and dynamic part. You can understand better this task of to surf in tennis, because for a while. The stable part is the same for a while. Then when he's jumping, it's changing. And even if I'm looking for another point of view, like here is the lateral view, the stable part is still the stable part, you see? So again, coming back to the classic understanding, here's this uh, linear uh, comprehension. And with this um, tensibility understanding, we can see easier the spirals, no? Because again, we see this stable and dynamic and it's, um, behaving behaving all together at the same time no one part is stable one time is dynamic and this viewing it in the three-dimensional point of view it's easier to see those uh, spirals in movement maybe this image could also help uh, we also been taught that uh, there are muscles of stability and there are other muscles that uh, work out with mobility if you see here, this person, what I see is that he's stabilizing some parts, some segments, and then mobilizing some other segments, but it's not like some mobility and stability muscles, but rather than segments, no? So if you would like to see the video again with me, for example, in this moment, the stability is mostly on the arms of course and the rest of the spine now he's moving the shoulders now the he's changing every time the stability and the mobility point for example now he's moving the lumbar part no and you can see here easily the spirals again well with the tensegrity understanding maybe instead of uh, again going back to this stability and mobility muscles that allow us to keep the posture and, and movement which is like understanding more like la longitudinal, um, how do you say, stability, like a longitudinal stability, the tensegrity understanding maybe allowed us to think that it's a transversal understanding, no? So like that is not just important part of the muscle rather than the, um, Whatever is inside of that volume, no? For, for example, in this leg is the muscle and the bone and the rest of the tissues, but here on the of the of the abdomen part, again, the stability and dynamics of the guts and visceral will be also very important and interesting for this um dynamic uh, stable system while it's working, no. So for example, I am able to allow to not only thinking about muscles, but thinking on key parts to work. So here I put just ankle, foot, hips, thorax, uh, and scapulas, uh, spinal center alignment, and hamstring ribs. You see it's not just, just joints, rather than uh, well key parts or group of joints. Also uh, knee and elbow, for, uh, of course, I, didn't, I did not want to forget, but with this systemic view, I can also consider important to work the girls' dissociation. So like that will be more efficiency to walk or run or whatever task uh, the person wants to develop. And why not? Uh, I would like to mention here the eye, no? So for example, why is the eye going to improve the movement? Well, because if the person is getting better information again from the environment, she or he is moving in, well, then it's going to perform, it's going to do another self-organization and then it's going to perform the movement differently, easily, but of course, uh, different. So, confronting finally biomechanics, uh, well, classic versus tensegrity informed biomechanics. The classic understanding, as we saw, is uh, based on the anatomy and the tensegrity informed is or, or focus on the anatomy and the tensegrity informed uh, biomechanics are focused on functionality. Classic understanding is from machines and then we applied it to the body. 
we did that because it was the best science on that time. But nowadays we're doing like uh, watching and uh, observing the living and the not living nature in movement. The classic understanding uh, give us some calculations and measurements and the uh, tensority in form is uh, again more uh, concentrated on behavior of the system. The classic is focused on the lineal work and the lineal path and the tensegrity in form is uh, working on the exponential improvements. No, instead of just working like I'm improving the flexion or the extension range of motion from my shoulder, with the tensegrity in form application, I am uh, improving um, the expansion and the increase of the volume in the three dimensional. That is why so it's is exponential. No. For those of you that did not believe that the line is not the answer, I have this video here where we can see how the line is not the fastest or the shortest line. Uh, of course it's not when we are in a gravita gravitational uh, environment. And again, the classic uh, understanding of biomechanics is like a kind of family recipe and the tensegrity informed biomechanics, they, it fits it fit the questions. What questions? Well, again, these biologic interesting questions that are answered by tensegrity. Tensegrity is filling the three dimensionality. Again, it's creating the, bio the volume, this uh, compression tension elements relating each other is creating the volume, the three dimensionality. We have sense of balance during movement and rest. Of course, the, the system knows if it's standing, if it's uh, lying, or if it's doing handstanding, and even when we're doing handstanding, um, the head is not falling down, no? So this is about the stability of the system. And it's always moving in the maximum power, looking for the minimum effort is the efficiency low, no? This is again, when it's going to be a dynamic, uh, when it's going to do a movement, it's all the time um, stable dynamic or dynamically stable. Um, it's looking for the best movement for wasting the less effort or the less uh, energy. And it's, uh, there's a still one question, how can the shape resist gravity? Well, I have here this picture on the left. You can see this ant holding 100 times its weight. And here you can see this tensegrity model. Uh, also, uh, it's not 100 times its weight because the tensegrity model weights 167 grams and it's holding 16,000 grams. Okay, so it's something like 97, but it's not bad. And some of you could be thinking, yeah, but Fernando, but you can hold this weight with three sticks to the floor and that's it. You're having the same with even less sticks. Yeah, but this structure, tensegrity structure, is holding the weight and still you can move it. You can move some of the um, struts and you can see how it expands and compresses all together. No? I have this video also. I would like to ask you which one is better to explain the human movement, which column, which spines is better, there are just four, to explain human movement. The first one was rigid, the first, second one was elastic, this is the third one is mixed, like with a hard landing. And the last one, is mixed with a soft landing. So I'm asking again, which one is better to explain movement? What do you think? For example, if I'm falling to the floor, I would like to have this one. So that, that it's getting stiff and protects the interior, no? If I'm playing basketball, I rather prefer this one. So that I am rebounding and jumping again to grab the ball. No? Maybe this third one is to explain if I were having a tray and someone hits me on the back and I just make this movement so that I don't lose my tray. And the last one for me maybe could be like the best one because it's like the most rounded one. But again, my favorite answer is it depends on the task. It depends on the environment. I would like all of them depending on the task that I'm doing. So again, the tensegrity understanding is a very good view 
to make a better comprehension and application about human movement. So how does this change in approach to movement? I'm focusing more in the hands-off applications, in the exercise applications, okay? So um, in the classic approach to movement, well, sorry, remember that even if we have this kind of modern drawing with these circles and all these beautiful things, this way of thinking is from the 17th century, don't forget this, having a better and a newer, and it's not because it's newer, it's because it's better explained as I tried to explain. Uh, the difference in approach between the two of them is that the classic approach prioritizes mobility, while the tensegrity prioritizes stability. In the classic approach, we move through anatomic movements, and in the tensegrity informant, we are, or me, with the elderly people are looking for the daily life activities and tasks. In the classic approach, we are working by repetitions and series. In the tensegrity inform, we're working by times and demands. Classic approach is um, working mostly uh, on their weight or um, seen to be to strength the, the muscle and the system. And the tensegrity informant approach is um, giving more importance to control and stability work. In the classic approach, we are mostly working in open kinematic change work. And in the tensegrity inform, we are prioritizing the closed kinematic kinetic survey and kinematic chain work. And in the classic approach, we are thinking on muscles are there working in concentric and an eccentric uh, labor. And in the tensegrity in four maybe allows us to think more in isometric and isokinetic movement. So um, doing an application in a patient, I would like to please introduce you one of my favorite patients. Uh, maybe she's my favorite one. Um, I have here a little resume about her clinics. She's 89 years old. Uh, she have five deliveries, you say so, no? Five births, like she was having five children, yeah? Uh, just for the record, she have a cardiac pacemaker, and with the second battery change when the video were when the videos were recorded, it was the second battery change. Now it's in the third, and the motivation for the consultancy, she called me because after falling on his back while going upstairs, she fissure up a uh, fissure right scapular and a. Uh, scapula, sorry, no scapula, uh, the bone, and she fissure also three ribs. Uh, we, on the right arm got some tendonitis, and of course she got fear of stairs. So let me introduce you the ladies and some of her problems. She had some problems opening the outdoors, like the one from the, this is the one from the house, and but it was worse the one from the lip. I couldn't I couldn't record it, but it was worse the one from the lip. Yeah. So again, um, it's missing some strength. It's missing some. Uh, if we analyze properly, this is a tensional movement for the elbow, for the shoulder. Well, yeah, for the shoulder, and now it's pushing the door. So again, it's pulling, pushing environment all the time, even doing regular tasks. Yeah. As you see, she's wearing the, the cane, and so she's having some balance problem. So I'm going to share with you, um, this wasn't the very, very best day, the very, very first day, sorry, but it was something like that. Uh, when I arrived this day, it's like she was uh, grabbing something very fast. So like we went back to the first point. She couldn't move the, the shoulder properly. And she was feeling again the pain in the scapula where she fissured. Okay, so I podría hacerlo con la palma de esa. Sorry, I create for her an environment where she could accommodate the shoulder and move it. As you can see, sliding on top of this tool. It's not like a very close kinematic change movement, but yes, it is. 
closet because it's uh, one of the planes is uh, forbidden or locked, okay? So even she's sliding is easier or is lower intensity in the shoulder, no? Later on, I prepare, now this could be more close kinematic, even it is an instability uh, surface. But again, she is not holding the weight of the arm. And I am trying her to move the scapula. As you can see, she's moving um, the rest of the body rather than the scapula, but it's okay. We love her anyway. And like that, I know where uh, it's uh, my work need to be focused. So later on, well, I'm asking her here if she has pain. Yeah, later on, there you go. I even more close more the chain i put the I, I asked her to put the hand in the in the head so like that the arm is not hanging here is not as weight as before and then because she was better she said is it no it is like when she puts like, like that when she get to this position she was she's saying uh, it is like it's not painful anymore. So I ask her to raise one leg. So like that I am asking for another demand. You see, so more demanding, but no more movement, more strength, more speed on the problem. Yeah. So she's raising this leg very bad. You can see about her trunk. And then she's raising the other leg. Well, she was nicer with the other leg uh, raising. Here I put this part. You can hear that I presume, but I ask her to tell me to tell me three flags with the green color. Okay, here, when she was sat, when she was set here, I asked her, can you tell me please three flags with her? As she, went, she said no. So here, I put her, I asked her to be like this. And what I am looking here, well, again, I am looking some stability here through the arms. Uh, sorry, 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 through the chairs. Hold on one second. Here you go. Here with the arms through the chairs, I'm looking for some stability and through the mobility and stability, of course, in the leg on the on the on the floor, and through the mobility and the pendulum from the right um, leg, I am creating some disturbances in the right shoulder. What is my focus on? Okay. So in this moment, I ask her to tell me three names of her great granddaughters you say so no great granddaughters okay so she stops to listen to me she smiles and she starts look at her movement look 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 it's bigger it's 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 strong it's faster it's look the rest of the body you see because i get to her emotional right, no? even she's, she's almost moving this chair as you can see, I uh, know. And well, now I, I ask her for another demand. I ask her to turn the, le the neck to the left side. It was worse for her. And here on the right side, she was, it was, it was more comfortable for her. So here, again, I'm creating environments, compression, tension, different movements, okay, to allow her to create a pop up response and to come up with the task. So facing again, Classic biomechanics will lead us to make this kind of exercise. We are not here to criticize our partner that put this uh, exercise. We don't know the history clinic from this lady. Uh, she's presumed to have 79 years old here where it's been recorded. But for example, in here, you are putting a little bit risky for your, for your patient, but it's okay. If she's still coming, that's okay. But what I want to say with this video is, again, we can follow the path or we could be following the path with some patients through the classic understanding and the classic use uh, of movement. But the proposal with the biotensegrity is very different. So as we were talking about, we're looking for lower demanding, close kinematic chains, looking for time doing things. So here at the beginning, I just let her explore, just move her around the, the spinach. Um, as you can see, she's doing like quite fast and as, as whatever she feels like doing it. 
Here I'm giving her a little rest. Remember that resting is very important when we are working movements. And again, what I am doing here, I'm asking her to lie down facing up. And with the cushions, I am creating an environment for her uh, accommodancy, for, for, for comfortable, for, for her being comfortable. She was moving the, the, the ankles. Now she's testing the hips. She was feeling like that, and she was doing this bicycle in the air. I never asked her for doing it, but she was feeling nice and 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 ready to do it. No, so um, I explained her how to come out so like that she could rest whenever she feel like doing it, and we start working. And I, I like to start with the hips. So again, it's close in kinematic chain, and when she puts the hands, it's even easier and closer to kinematic chain to raise the hips. Where we, for example, do came back for uh, facing down. And again, I asked her to move the legs, but look, she's doing it very fast because this is what she knows from the from the from the regular uh, classic biomechanics understanding. No, but I create with this churro, with this roll, I create the environment for her to do the static. You see, I just want to show you one thing there. When she do the static there, the isometric, I ask her to push here on the floor so that she's creating a space here again in the hip and in the lumbar part, okay? Mm, now we are working in the upper limb. Uh, she's like, um, how do you say? It's not hiking, it's trepar, how do you say? Well, it's working on the, on the floor, okay? And now I ask her to rise the same side. So one leg and one arm of the same side, like if she was swimming. So again, now we start opening the chain. Of course, I'm not saying we need to work every time in closed kinematic chains. And remember to respect the um, resting. So um, I believe I still have some time. Yes. So uh, let's see more work about this lady. Uh, because she's having the problem standing, well, I need to propose her some work while she stands. I mean, opening that door, the lift door, or or the stable uh, problem. So we do the some uh, spiraling movements. And now here, for example, I am looking. I ask her to cross her feet and then to, uh, maybe you don't see it in the video because I cut it, I'm asking her to uh, turn the head. So that Fair, I'm looking Fair, excuse me. We want yeah. to give some time for discussion. So yeah. we have we have 15 more minutes for discussion. Okay, okay. okay. Just, just, just to let you know. You. Thank you very much, thank you very much. So again, the, um, I am looking for creating environments for her security. Here she's practicing how to not fall and how to recover a possibly fall, and here the same, no? We are uh, raising the hats, the uh, arms, because they were the tendonitis was better, so we are raising it, we close the chain, and then I can ask for another demand, like raising the uh, hips. Just the last video from this lady, and then we go to conclusions and discussion. Of course, I asked her to throw and get in. Um, I presume you don't have the volume. Uh, she was celebrating the first one because she, she's getting in. And then she keeps on throwing, she keeps on throwing. I'm going to go straight to the point. It's here. So again, mobility, stability, you see? She needed to create and perform her own self-organization for in that moment in time, she felt, and it's her who needs to do it. She needs to feel that it's falling. She needs to look up for the better uh, response to uh, hold the situation. We have here plenty of videos that we are not seeing. Remember, again, the conclusions under my understanding is, again, with well, the proposal from different approach between the classic and the tensibility informed uh, understanding. And uh, just talking about movement, if this iridescent cloud represents the movement, which is infinitive possibilities, wherever you know, for example, yoga, pilates will give us the chance to create 
and imagine the movement in another manner. But when you really understand tensegrity, it allows you to take your patient to wherever level they want to. And if I do properly my job, now you are understanding this little cat perfectly well how to create environment, which part is the stability part from the cat, the mobility one, and how her owner or um, a partner is um, getting the relation with, with, with it. So thank you very much for your attention. And now is the time, please. What are your questions? Outstanding, Fernando. Thank you so much. That that really uh, starts us off beautifully with understanding the the contrast between how we were taught in school and straight planes and uh, traditional biomechanics versus your wonderful explanation of how biotensegrity comes into your patient care. So now we're going to open it up for questions. And what I'd like you to do is go to the bottom of the screen and you can see um, the reactions um, um, uh, button. And if you press that, the bottom bar said raise hand, and that will put you up in the queue as Alyssa is right now. And we can take questions one at a time for about 15 minutes. So Alyssa, will you start us out with, uh, you, will you unmute yourself and, um, or will somebody unmute her? Good. Okay. I'm unmuted. So great. Um, Fernando, thank you so much. This was incredible to watch your uh, um, videos. Well, now, please, if, we, if we get involved in the uh, um, um, biotensegrity with physios and we learn techniques, are we learning things that you showed us? Uh, sorry, sorry. Can you repeat me the question? So is the therapy that you're doing with your clients, your patients, something that we learn if we dive deeper into biotensegrity uh, for physios. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I believe you will understand and, um, and learn how to create, for example, taking this example, the exercise for the client to improve through a biotensegrity lens. So that they have more security and they have a, a how do you say, um, and regular improvement. I think too, yeah. Fernando, the, 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 the point that you're trying to make, if, if I may, is this, this understanding biotensegrity helps you to shift your lens, as you said, uh -huh. so that you see the patient differently and you see the demand on your patient differently than we were taught in school with the traditional uh, straight plane kind of uh, perspective. Um, and uh, Alyssa, if you stay with us, we're going to talk more about a little bit about the course that we provide online for physical therapists to learn about biotensegrity. And in that course, um, we have cases uh, with every class where we demonstrate how those perspectives that we're learning that day in the course now can be applied to patient care examples very much like Fernando showed us, so. Yes, 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 Carol, thank you very much. Yes, Alisa, uh, the same as Carol, I wanted to say that what Carol says, and uh, yes, because you are having the whole picture, the view from the whole picture. So it's not only the exercise, but mm, rather recommend her to sit in another chair than the one she's using, or having the whole picture of her, her whole day, so that you can give her some advices to, mm, make some difference during the day so like that she 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 she's stable in her in her clinic you see yeah it's not only movements or exercise that you learn no no you learn it's not recipes that you learn it's not you you learn how to cook when i arrive to the house i don't have material you just go with a little bag with some balls and some uh, uh, rubber bands and some not rubber bands, non-elastic bands and some other things. And that's it. We just create. There. Great. Pedro. Thank you, Alyssa, for, uh, for your, uh, your question and be very welcome. Um, I want to say that perhaps if you can keep your question for and, and bring it on again in the last segment of our meeting, when we'll talk about how we can create support in this community, I think it 
it might be very nice. In fact, I'm remembering what Eileen presented uh, earlier today, and um, I felt that she somehow used this lenses, you know, this new paradigm, this new understanding of how things work, and she kind of created, she pulled from things that she knew, techniques and methods she knew, something that would fit what she what she uh, wanted to bring to the to her to her patient. So it's not really a new method, but something that you can see in a different way. And then you can use the things that you that you're familiar with or or as Fernando said, create new things using the ingredients that you have. So um, maybe you can bring this question again and Eileen can uh, can comment on the last segment. Um, I have a question for Fernando, but uh, I just want to see I if someone else. Uh, has uh, has a question before me because some people are putting questions in the in the chat and oh, I was going to say that questions and comments oh. in the chat as well so I don't know if you want to address them too. Mariana, do you have a a, a bead on a question in the chat that you could offer? I am checking and I couldn't find. You 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 didn't find any, yeah. I can find it. So Pedro, on, on the meantime, maybe okay. it's your time. So, okay. Um, actually, I had two questions, Fernando, but I I lost the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I made a comment. You were saying something in, in your presentation. It was so, I mean, made some connections in my mind so brilliant. I put a short comment, but I forgot to take a note. But the second time, I took the note. <laughs> so this is the one I'm putting. <laughs> And um, and I was curious to see um, um, how you you you're you're sh uh, sharing that um, that shot that video from from your patient making the movement with the leg and then suddenly you you ask her to say the names of the grand grandchildren. Uh huh. And how? then, huh? Yeah, yeah. 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 And then the pattern of the movement changes and it it gets better function yeah wide longer but you see that the movement it's more i mean biologically you know more efficient more everything it was a rebounding movement that what that what, what, what i was looking for but at the beginning she was not doing like really rebounding but yes so i was thinking about um so when um when you put less control so she's sort of distracted like trying to remember something and perhaps something effective, I mean, with emotion. When there's less control, the movement flows better. What, how do you, I mean, how do you see that? Uh, how do you interpret what, what happened there? Okay, uh, yes, I, I agree with you. In that situation, in that example, the movement gets better because as I was trying to explain in the video, First, I ask her for the green flags. She stopped the movement because it's some, something cognitive. And then I ask her for the names of the great granddaughters, which is more emotive. And in this situation, the movement was better. It's usually like that when you reach the emotional part of the patient. But again, uh, maybe the same solution won't work the same with a different patient or different situations you see maybe if i get her to do a handstand imagine her doing a handstand and i ask her there for the names of the great granddaughters she's telling me to go out from her house okay mm -hmm. so depending again on the situations yes but yes you are right by thinking like that because when you get into the emotional again you are like um, touching more that system. So in my experience, most of the times the movement gets better, get best, get better, but uh, we need to analyze it case by case and situation by situation. It's my understanding. And one of the dynamics of biotensegrity, I think that's most critical is every patient is different every time. And of course, we're taught very much in physical therapy to lump patients together and by diagnostic label and to treat patients the same every time in order to try to, to um, 
improve uh, validity and reliability of our methods. And it never works. People are always different. And, and, and you'll say to one person, tell me the names of your great grandchildren and they will emote and, and be very much smoother in, in, in their movement. Another one will stop and say, oh, well, I, and they'll they'll have to remember and and it will it won't be the same so you have to be present in the moment with the person and know that person a little bit to try to get the outcome that you want um and this is part of also what we teach about the relationship with the patient is so critical fiona would you like to give your question please thank you um just it, it's very brief i think they're answering some of it in the written part but it was about the discontinuous compression members if i understand it correctly and i just want to see to apply that to the body would that be something like the bones they obviously have a bit of compression but their one bone is not directly connected to another bone uh-huh the bones is not connected directly to another bone that is discontinuous compression elements so they are not a continuous a bone. There are two bones that they have a little space between them. Maybe I, I, I didn't understand the question. Yeah. No, that's right. I just wanted to apply the theory to the body <laughs> and figure out a part of the body. Ah, okay. So, for example, the knee. For my, my, my favorite example, oh boy, I have, have plenty, but the knee. The knee needs to hold my 80 kilos, 80 something kilos where I am standing with the femur on top of the tibia and also needs to raise my 85 kilos where I am raising a step or something, you see? And again, never, no time is touching one to the other and it's giving me the stability to hold my weight and the stability and mobility environment to raise my weight. So then the, the fascia around the muscles and all the soft tissue, they, that tenses that, in a way to hold the joint apart to Dep manage it, manage the yeah, depending on the environment, yeah, it's tending to hold the joint apart. Yes, yes, of course. All, but not only the tensional web, but the relationship between the tensional web, the compression elements. I think for us physios, it's it's that switch from the more linear approach to this, which it's that tension change which allows the movement. The ch tension changes allow the movement, but you mean that shorten it and and lengthen of the muscles. You mean? Yeah, but it that's more a change in the tension, not really shorter and longer. Uh, it's, there is a length change, but it's more due to the tension. We were always taught to get rid of the tension, but actually, it's very important. <laughs> Well, we have to get rid of the tension until one point. We need some tension to hold. If I get rid of my tension, I just follow like this. Exactly. And, just like this. and too much tension, like looking for the strength and the high tone, is not uh, rather as good. So exactly. we look to yeah. Yeah. for yeah. Okay. the proper tension. But the tension is not only come, the tension of the system, it's not only coming from the tensional members. The tension is yeah. coming from the tension created between the tensional members and the con and the compression members. And and what Stephen Levin teaches us is that depending on the um, the task at hand, there are times when the bones are the tensional elements rather than the compressional elements. Yeah, this is very interesting. Also, I have an example with the bone in a row. I have time, Mariana, to explain, um, or maybe we we'll wait for later. Yeah. <laughs> For example, bow on a row. If we, Mariana, Caro, Fiona, have a bow to throw on a row, you say bow is the element, no? And I thought, who is throwing the row? The, arrow. the archery, oh. the string, or the bow? Throwing the row, throwing the bow. The for arrow, the I think. The arrow. I think he means the bow and arrow. The arrow, so arrow is the thing that flies, no? Arrow, how do you arrow. say that? Arrow, the arrow. Arrow, sorry, the arrow. Arrow. arrow is the okay. thing that flies, no? Okay, yeah, yeah. So yes. who's throwing the arrow? The archery, the string, or the bow? Right. Yeah, Under yeah. this question, my best answer is the system of the three, because I am physiotherapist yeah. and I don't want to right. get worse, so I throw it in the middle. Then the system of the three, okay? So 
between the three, which one is creating, holding, or uh, loading the newtons or strength enough to throw the arrow at 240 meters? Before you answer, the archery is not because the ball didn't know if it's Mariana holding it, if it's Fiona holding it, or if it's me who holding it. Okay, so between the two actors that we have, who is the one that is creating or uh, uh, loading the newtons or the strength enough to throw the arrow 240 meters? The archer. No, I took at I took at the archery. Ah, you say the bow. You're seeing the bow or the archery. The archery is not because because the bow make always the same bow make always the same distance. So it's not the archery. We are just having two other actors, string and the bow. Which one do you say? That, come on, all, all of you. Let's say string, bow, <laughs> whatever you feel like it. This I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to fake it for you. I'm going to uh, make a movie for you. When I pull, when I push the bow and I pull from the string, is the bow that goes like this and get flexed and stores the energy. And then the string says like, it goes through that, uh, that direction. And the bow goes that direction, 700 Newtons, you see? So mm -hmm. the question here is, if the archery is the muscle, the tendon is the string and the bone is the bow, the could be happening in this musculoskeletical system that the uh, bone is flexing, storage, uh, storing and, and releasing energy in this uh, myofascial muscular web. It's not possible. It's 2,100% for real because all the materials in this uh, planet bend under the properly uh, strength, okay? So again, also the bone is moving and we consider so in the definition as a compressed element, but it behaves depending on the task and depending on the environment, you see? Okay, good, thanks. George, Thank you. if you'll hold your question, please, and write it down because I wanna give Mariana a chance to get started on her presentation. And Mariana, did you have a question or a comment that you wanted to? Yeah, just a comment quickly, uh, Fiona. I, I, on a big level, we say that the bones are the compressional elements, but don't forget that the bone itself, it's also a tensegrity. So in the bone, you have both. So, and it really changes in, into what is the environment around. So we don't, we can, we have, we absolutely have to move out of the simplistic way of saying that in a in a um, in a model, these are the bones or this is fascia and muscle, because it's not true. It, this is a very simplistic way of understanding it, and, and that's not the plan here. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, no, there was yes, George, you had a question. Go for it quickly, and then I'll start my presentation if that's okay. I didn't want to take your time. Sorry. Thank you. Or yeah, well, basically, uh, Fernando, you and both of you and Mariana have answered that. And really, the artificial separation of bone from the rest of the fascial system is really just something that <clears throat> I don't think applies. And as I say, within the tensegrity model, I, I would say the separation of tension and compression elements is really artificial. Really, they're interconnected. The tubules and uh, you know the microfilaments, all of them are one continuous unit. So this idea of the compression elements are not contiguous to me doesn't really fit. And I think Fernando, you explained that very well with that bow and arrow analogy. That's perfect. You know, that to me is there's only one system. Okay, so thank you. That's great. Well, person. no, thank you. Thank you. And just taking your words is also working in the macro level about the bone and the muscles and also at the micro level with the microtubules and microfilaments and and the, and the extracellular matrix. Exactly. Right, and it's always the sum of tension and compression. It's the product together, like the yin-yang. It's never one or the other, it's the product together, right? Good. All right, wonderful, wonderful discussion. And uh, if, if you have questions, please jot them down because we have time later for discussion. But now let's turn the mic over to Mariana and let's take a look at some 
patients with cerebral palsy and her work with uh, CP children. Thank you, Carol. And I, before I start, I just want to, uh, I just want to let everybody know here uh, that Dr. Steve Levin, who is the father of bioinsecurity, he's the one who, who developed all this, is in this meeting room with all, all of us. Okay, and. I, when I when I was very new to biotensegrity, and this specifically happened with Susan as well, who's also another important piece in this, I didn't know who they were. Honestly, I had no idea how they look or how they. I, so I I was sharing in in Zoom meetings with them. I had no idea who they. So I just want to acknowledge that, and I want to say thank you, Dr. Levin, for all what you have done. Um, you're welcome to ask uh, to talk anytime you want for uh, during this session. I'm really grateful for everything you have done. And we are really, really trying our best to, to keep your work and bring it to the next level in, in, in this case, in our special, special oh, speciality. Okay, good, enough. So thank you again from my heart. I'm, I'm about to cry here. I'm very excited <laughs> that this is happening. Yeah, okay. Um, I never, I never, I, why, why I'm like this? Okay. Share screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, let me try to bring it here. Well, you're gonna see me. Hold on. Being a Zoom manager, oh my goodness, that's not what I want to do with you. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh my goodness. Okay, stop sharing, Mariana. You're <laughs> <laughs> Spoiling it. <laughs> Hold on. Too fast. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold on. Let me go back. Sorry about it. So, you see, Stacy, I told you that it's okay that we're humans. We were practicing how to do this before, and it didn't work for me. Interesting, my computer doesn't want to show me my presentation. So while Mariana fixes her, her uh, presentation, I, if, I would like, I have a second question for, for Fernando if, why we, you fix it. Is that all right, Mariana? If I, if yeah, I... it's, it doesn't want to go in presentation mode. Really? Okay, it, it's on now, it's on now. It's okay. On. Okay, let's not touch it then. Touch it, all right. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna share my screen with my presentation. And yeah. are you seeing me with an ugly face there? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that uh, now I have all my... And do you see this the black things from Zoom? Or you're good? No, no. No, it's... okay, good. Good. All right. Okay, so um, this is... Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about how biotensegrity transformed, in this case, my assessment of the hip in kids with cerebral palsy. But I have to say that it it's, it's not just that it transformed my my assessment, my treatment, my approach, how I talk about them, how I interact with the families, and it actually transformed most of the things that I do in my life today. So my, I would say that my life is a before and after biotensegrity. I'm Mariana, I'm originally from Venezuela, and I live in Canada, in Toronto, and I, I work with kids with CP, okay? And what I want to uh, share with you in this, um, in this conversation is my face there, and I'm not sure if that face is me saying, oh my gosh, she's doing it all wrong, or me saying, how come I never thought about this before? And I'm going to tell you the story of you know, how, I, uh, how I got there and what happened after, and hopefully share with you, um, you know, how beautiful this journey has been. Uh, just briefly, cerebral palsy, as the, I found this description in the CP Foundation, uh, describes a group of permanent disor disorders of development and of movement and posture causing activity limitations 
attributed to a non-progressive disturbance that occur in the developmental developing fetal or infant brain. So there's a brain injury that it's set, it's non-progressive, that creates a bunch of issues afterwards, okay? Uh, the motor disorders of cerebral palsy are often accompanied by disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, communication, and behavior, epilepsy, um, and by secondary musculoskeletal problems. It's, it is known that we have we are class, uh, classifying these kids according to the gross motor function classification scale in five levels. Being level one, the mildest one, the kids, these kids can walk uh, independently, and level five, where they're fully independent, uh, dependent, sorry, for every activity in their life. And I'm gonna bring this uh, because, you know, since I study physiotherapy and, and I was very involved within cerebral palsy from the very beginning, the one thing they tell you at school is, okay, CP, you know, motors, plasticity, they have all these developmental issues. Uh, be careful with the hips because they're going to be subluxed and be careful with the scoliosis and be, ca be careful with contract contractors, right? So from the very beginning, you have this chip in your head. Okay, I have to prevent hip subluxation. And it is so true that this is from the, Acad the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. They, this is the surveillance that they do for the, for the hips. So basically they're saying that kids who are level one has the lowest risk and kids who are level five have the highest risk. And then they recommend uh, things to, to keep on track depending on the level, that the level will determine how often you do this every six months for the more severe cases and every two years for the less. Um, and basically they're telling us you have to change, you have to uh, check passive range of motion, tone, special tests, asymmetries, and you know, check how everything is in terms of, of care, weight bearing, and uh, the ability to walk. Okay. And the reason why I'm bringing this because we all learn how to change, how to check range of motion, right? And I'm I'm bringing some examples here. This is how I learned it in Spanish. Of course, this is in English now. But you need we learn how to use goniometers. We learn how to put them in the axis of the movement. We know how we learn how to what was the testing position, what was the stabilization needed. So if I'm gonna test hip flexion, I should stabilize or at least make sure that the body, the torso is stabilized so I can actually measure properly the hip flexion, okay? And the same goes with his ex his hip extension, hip abduction, um, abduction, all the, all the tests, we know that. And I consider myself um, a very good hip tester, should I say. I work uh, for some years at the the uh, a gate laboratory. This was the first laboratory in, in South America, actually. And I was testing hips every day. Like there were a bunch of things that we would have to measure the, the antiversal femoral um, angle. We had to measure all the, all the tests for the hips, for the legs, I mean, for everything. And we have to take those measure, measurements and give it to the engineer so he could plug that into the computer to um, to 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 have the kids being tested with the cameras and all that. And then these were the graphs that were coming out of the machine, right? And based on those graphs, uh, the doctors were and and ourselves too, the therapists were there part of that conversation. We were uh, they were deciding what surgeries to do. Okay. Um, and that was part of my of my practice. The next, the rest of the day, I was also doing therapy with these kids, mainly NDT oriented, uh, and I was using everything I needed that, that I have learned to prevent hip subluxation. So I was doing the standing, the stretching, the activation, the strengthening. I was doing everything that I have learned to prevent uh, hip subluxation. And the truth is that mm, sometimes it didn't work. On most times didn't work. These kids will end up having surgeries anyways. They will have multiple surgeries throughout their life. Um, my, especially as they were growing older in teenagerhood and all that it was a lot more complicated. So yeah, it wasn't really going well according to my expectations at least, at least okay? In 2008, and this picture is about that time, um, I, I found the work of 
Leonid Bloom. And it, it took me two years to get a little bit understanding. It was very hard for me to understand. It was two years of, I don't get this, but it sounds interesting. So let me, so it was like a little bit of a fight in my head. And finally, in 2010, I convinced uh, some of my families that I they were working with me to go to Florida and take one of his uh, training for families, right? So this is the picture of that day. This is one of my girl. Um, and, and, and then this is the lady that worked with Leonid back then. Um, and she was, she's testing the hip and she's explaining what is what she's seeing. So in my head, I'm, I'm both judging and kind of regretting how come I didn't think about this myself. And then uh, this is another of my kids. And you see, it's the same face. It, I didn't change my face throughout the whole thing. I'm, I'm like, what is she doing? There's something not, I mean, you shouldn't do this that like that. That's basically what I'm saying in my head. And I'm also talking to my, she's an OT that also went with us. Like we are kind of judging in a way, okay? I'm really glad I have those pictures from there. So what, what I was missing was fascia and biotensegrity, but especially biotensegrity, because I already knew a little bit about fascia, but what made sense in the end to me was the whole concept of biotensegrity. And I've been lucky enough uh, for the last, I don't know how many years now, 14 probably, um, to be very close to the ones who are developing this, right? Especially Dr. Levin and Leonid Blooms, uh, Chris Clancy is there, Susan, uh, you are there too, <laughs> but we haven't met ever in person. Uh, Graham Scar as well, and man, is Yon Charky, like Dr. Brad, uh, Will, like so many good people that I've been so fortunate enough to be in contact and to to learn directly from them. What I want to say here, and I'm going to try to keep this super brief, um, is that we are we are talking about models. Okay, this is a model. This is a way to explain what whatever we want to explain and the model that we have in our head is going to influence everything we do right if we're coming as the as the mandala that camilla showed at the beginning if we're coming from a mechanical model that's what we're going to see or do if we're coming from a more like a different model like the tensegrity model then that's going to inform what we do differently right when we translate those models into the body, then we're talking about biomechanics and biotensegrity, okay? And I'm going to read this from a Graham score uh, book. Biotensegrity is a structural design principle that describes a relationship between every part of an organism and the mechanical system that integrates them into a complete functional unit. So it's a design principle, right? It's not it's not the truth or the way. It's a way of seeing it. And that model explains the forces that organize the living organism. From microbes, from, we just talked about that with Fernando, going deep and zooming in or zooming out in the body. And um, these are the lessons that I take from biotensegrity that mostly inform what I'm doing in the assessment. The shape of that organism is gonna rise from the balance between tension and compression. A tent is not a full tensegrity structure because it's anchored on the ground, but this is a good illustration of what a good balance between tension and compression can do to a shape, okay? So if I'm thinking about cerebral palsy and the distortions that we see in their bodies, I, I absolutely have to think about this relationship for the shape. Muscles are the tensors in that tensional system. That's an important one for me because I explain muscle tone and spasticity based on this principle. So when I see a muscle that is tight, I'm thinking that muscle is helping bring in the tension in the system. Why? Why that muscle has to work harder or tighter to, to create tension? What is, what is going on there, right? And this is another super important one because the organism is always performing in its most energy efficient way. So that has helped me to, um, to um, hold on, sorry, I got a call here. That has helped me to, to say, even when my child is very, very effective and the movement is very, like it's not functional, 
that that and maybe he has so many deformities and so many contractors and so many things that is his most efficient energy efficient way of performing there's nothing wrong there it's just that he's showing me where he's most balanced and this is i'm, I'm gonna come to this later as well okay this Leonie told me once our patients are the best teachers we can possibly have because if we take that our time to observe, they will let us appreciate what we usually take for granted. And this is also so true because unless you have a massive brain damage, you won't appreciate the things that we take for granted, like the collapse that we, we shouldn't have. We only experience that when something is really, really, really affected, okay? So when we take the time to to observe that and to, to learn from that, then they are our best teachers. The same way as the horse is the best teacher for a kutu, right? This is the example of what I what I give to the parents when I'm describing the way I see CP um, with, from this perspective, okay? Uh, if the if the jello with the fruits is, is that organism that has compressional and tensional elements in it, and here we could be very simplistic saying, oh, the fruits are the body parts and then the jello is the fascia. That could be a way of saying this. Then when we don't have that right balance between tension and compression, or when we don't have the, the right the amount of time in the fridge to, to be firm, then we have the distortions. So when I see a child with cerebral palsy, I'm always thinking about my collapsed jello. I'm always thinking about my collapsed tent because I'm, I don't want to, waste time thinking about oh what is wrong with this strawberry and what is wrong with this whatever grape i want to understand the full system and what's the relationship between the parts so when i see my kids again i'm not thinking about oh he has a kyphosis or she has a scoliosis or she has no i'm thinking about okay what is the shape here what is what is not holding or what is not uh what what's happening with those parts and what's not supporting them properly. Going now to the assessment. Uh, this is a child, a neurotypical child, and I'm doing a hip, um, I'm gonna, I'm about to do a hip flexion test the way I learned how to do it now, okay? So you will say, Mariana, you're supposed to stabilize the torso, and I will say, okay, but his torso is pretty much stable. So why the torso is, is stable? Because the tensional balance in his system is good enough to keep the pelvis where it should be, to keep the abdomen where it should go, to keep the torso in that segment, to keep the neck there. So when I move the hip, the hip moves, or when I move the, the, the ankle in this case, because I'm creating like a huge, uh, arc there then is the hip what is moving yes there is a little bit of the lumbar spine there but it's mainly the hip that is moving and that happens if, if i'm going to stay on the hip that happens in oh, on the arms as well it happens in every part of our body okay when the body is properly organized the segments they are there then the joints can be joints and move where they should be moving they should move or where at least where i learned how to put the the gono goniometer on right so you see when the body is well stabilized then the movements happens happen at the joints now this is me doing the assessment of a cp child i have i have permission to to share his pictures from his mom that's why i'm sharing them this way and basically what i'm doing i'm doing the same i'm asking okay if i take the ankle and i create this arc where is the movement coming from? And that's the difference. I'm not testing range of motion of the flexion. I'm asking, is the system of this child balanced enough to organize the segments so the joints can move? And what is the answer? The answer is no. The answer is the tensional system between these different segments is not doing a good job the same way as the jello was not holding the fruits. So now the pelvis is sinking inside the abdomen, the abdomen is sinking inside the torso. And then the movement that is happening is not in a, in a, in a uh, sagittal plane anymore. There is a little bit of rotation there. There's a little bit of a spiral happening there. So what I'm seeing is very different 
of what I would see if I take the child, stabilize the anterior, this is in Spanish, it's easy in English, it's complicated, A ASIP, anterior superior iliac spine, there, if I put my hands there, and I stabilize that then, and then I take the leg and I look for the flexion of the hip. I am going to get there, but I'm taking for granted that his body is stabilizing it. So he has that movement available on his own. And the truth is that movement is not available if the body is not organized. Okay. And the same happened in this case with the adductors and ad ad adduction. I'm trying to, I'm testing where is the movement coming from? Where is the pivot of rotation? And you can see that that pivot, I hope you can see my cursor here. It's somewhere in this area, okay? That movement, I'm I'm only taking the, the, in this case, the right leg. And you see that the whole movement, it's happening somewhere above the, the belly button, okay? And you would say, Mariana, but that's because he has tight adductors. Well, okay, that's true for this boy. But what about this one? He doesn't have tight adductors and yet the movement is still coming from up here. Or what about this one, right? That there is some range there, but still the movement is translated all the way to up here. So it's not about the muscle, it's about where is the movement coming from, okay? Um, oh, hold on, I, please. Okay, so the other things that I learned, and this is not related to the hip, but I just want to go uh, to walk you through my whole a thinking process. One of the things that I learned when I when I was in that very first uh, assessment with the, the team of Leonid Bloom was like, uh, the kids are compressible. They compress under your hands. And I went like, that's not, that's not true. I've been working with these kids for like 12 years. It's impossible. No, no, no. They don't compress. Okay. Trust me on this one. I went back to the office af after that trip and every single, whoops, every single one of my kids compressed in the abdomen like this and i i was working with them for 12 years and i never ever 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 realized that on my own and why why that because i was maybe paying attention to oh am i rotating the spine am i moving the legs into flexion extension am i asking for the extensors to come up i'm asking for the abdominals to come i never pay attention to how strong this jello is to allow my hands to be on without sink, sinking in, right? And that's again, the good, the optimal balance of tension compression. Uh, and then the other thing that I learned is that we, we need to pay attention also to what's going on with the pelvis, right? And what is like this pelvis, and this is something that I, now I say with confidence, it took me a while to say it with confidence, and especially in a group of physiotherapists like this one, if I if I tell you, um, if let's say that your sister had a baby and you go to visit her and she has her month a month old baby and she's practicing standing with the baby, what would you say? You would say, "Don't do that! Don't do that! That pelvis is not ready. The hips are not ready. He's not supposed to do weight bearing on the legs." That's what we say to a newborn baby, right? But then we take a child with cerebral palsy who's five years old and the pelvis is in exactly the same shape that it was when he was born. And we say, you have to be in a standard frame to develop your pelvis. Does it make sense? Does it really make sense? So I learned how to pay attention to what was happening with the pelvis, okay? What I'm gonna show you now is what happens when we remodel and rebalance that tensional system. I don't want to get too much into the how we do the treatment because that's another two days conversation. I just want to say briefly that the techniques that I'm using today that I mainly learned from Leonid are techniques to, to work. And by the way, I don't do them. I teach that to the parents so they can do that at home. It's a, it's a, it's a very gentle and passive way to stimulate the fibroblasts within the tissues and to activate some, some basically fascia remodeling, okay? So what you're gonna see now is what happens after at least six months of work done by the parents, okay? So, so you understand this. This is the same boy that I showed you before. This is eight months later. And you can see how now that abdomen is, is fuller. Let's put it like that, okay? When that abdomen 
achieve a better relationship between that tension compression. So it's not compressible anymore. Then, oops, sorry. This should, yeah, there you, you can see like how from my hands sinking inside, they don't sink as much, okay? So that abdomen, if I go back to my very first picture of the child in flexion, that abdomen is now holding much better. And when it holds, it also allows that opening of the pelvis. So if I'm thinking about hip subluxation, I want to have a pelvis that has the right, the right development, volumetric development or openness. So there is a coverage for the, for the, for the head of the femur with the acetabulum. And we are so, unfortunately, so biased to see what is the relationship between the head of the femur and the acetabulum that we forget to see what's happening with the rest of the equation, right? And then this is the same boy. And I want you to, um, I'm gonna let this one play. So this is the initial assessment, okay? And the other one is six months later. So you see, I'm just testing, where is the movement coming from? And sometimes I go with my hands and I see how, how deep I can get in into that sinking. And the next video, so let me just pause this here. The next video, and you're gonna, oh my goodness. Okay, let me just pause it here. Well, you, you will have the comparison later. So this is eight months later. If you see up here, my face is gonna show a little bit. So pay attention to my smile because I was really happy, okay? So this is six, uh, eight months later. Mom worked with the techniques to remodel the whole, the whole thing to create that strength from, from within. And you see the movement is not perfect. He's still not fully segmented, but definitely that abdomen is much, much stronger. So it's not sinking, right? So here you have the, um, the comparison of the pictures. You see the difference between what was happening at the beginning and what is happening uh, after, after this. And the same for the adductors, for, for this test. Again, we cannot claim, oh, he's perfect. Now he can, you know, no, there's, there's a lot more to do. But what I want, and this, this might be a little bit harder for you to see, there is a, the, that pivot of rotation is now lower, okay? It's like before it was up here, now it's somewhere down here. And there is moments where I can actually get some movement that is available in the hip joint, okay? And of course, I mean, this is not a, a, a change from one day to the other. This might take many years, okay? And it also depends on how severe the child is, but you can see that now there are some movements that are available in there. Um, hold on. Okay, so, and that's with that case. I also have other examples, right? For example, this is a girl who is a, it's a mild girl, she's level three, and you can see the initial assessment, and this is done by the mom, you can see how that pivot of rotation was all the way up to here to the, to the uh, point, oh my goodness, what is going down, to the point that the pelvis was sinking, but then this is, um, this is like, oh, I think it's one year and two months later, sorry, I, fo I forgot to put the date there, how it's still sinking a little bit, but it's not, it's not as much as before, for sure, and how the dissociation between the legs has improved. And at this point, these parents, most of them, when they are testing my therapy, they kind of, many of them, they quit everything else. So here, this all is happening without stretching, without really strengthening, like active exercises. This is mostly uh, passive work, okay? This is another case, uh, seen from the view, uh, that you can see like how that pivot of rotation, and this happened after eight months, uh, that pivot of rotation went all the way to the pelvis, okay? So it's not, uh, now we, we think maybe it wasn't a problem of the muscle, right? And we go out there and cut muscles like crazy people. I shouldn't say that, <laughs> but it's true. Uh, my truth, I guess. This is another case. This is a level five boy, and you can see in two years the difference, how that changed. Okay, and also the develop the development of the pelvis down here. Okay, so of course, if we have a, a pelvis that is is offering a better sitting platform, and um and a, a system that is not required, so it's not the system is less is, is stronger, and the stronger the system is, the less the tone is needed. So I I believe the child is using tone to create that stability because they don't have that inner strength from, from the system. And actually I learned this 
back in 2001, when I had my NDT training, one of the approaches there was you give stability to the child on the torso so the child can relax the hands because they're compensating with tone. So this is, they were understanding this principle even though they were not talking about biotensegrity, right? And uh, again, more and more examples, like when we get that, that organization from the system, then the movement, even though there's still work to do a little bit down here on the legs, you can see how that is actually much, much stronger. Okay, more stronger. And again, this is my face today. Well, this is not today, this is a while ago, but I, I still have the same smile of me doing this, uh, confident that I'm, I'm giving them, the parents, an opportunity to help their kids that I'm really trusting and not judging what the, the child, oh, this is tight muscle, this is tight, this is lack of torso control. No, I understand this from the from the jello perspective. It's, it's a, it, we need to bring this jello that is a little bit weight to a much better balance. And with that, keeping an environment of positive things, things are possible and things can change. So thank you very much. That was phenomenal, Mariana. What a different perspective and a really nice comparison of, of a very frustrating population of, of patients that you're really making a difference and, and you're teaching the parents. The parents are doing the work and you're just demonstrating this. In the chat line, there's been recommendations for other people who are interested in the treatment technique that you use. Um, they can look up uh, the Biotensegrity Tea Party YouTube videos where you explain some of this and you and Leonid can be in dialogue yeah. with each other. You yeah. also have a course that you give on soft tissue and treatment of soft tissue that people can sign up for and um, enroll in. If yeah. you want to talk a little bit about that. What we can do, uh, honestly, I, my mistake, I should have have all these links, but I want to include the links of everyone from Fernando, from Stacy. So I promise that via email, we're gonna send you all the information, okay? Um, it's basically what we're doing. It's, it's working with different tools to create that environment in which the cells are gonna get activated and do the job. It's, it's facilitating the environment for the body to work. The course, I mean, my, what I do, it, I call it with flow therapy. Leonitz is ABR, Advanced Biomechanical Rehabilitation. And what we did together for professionals is called Tensegrity Assisted Therapy, which is putting all this concept of using semi-deflated balls to work on the, on the tissue, but not for cerebral palsy for whatever person they, uh, type of, of patient, okay? But again, this is not about those courses. This is about how Biotensegrity informed my assessment. And I, I'm really hoping to get some feedback, comments, um, Right. I'm, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you said that. And I'm glad that Trish Houston's still here, Trish, because this is, they're working with the fibroblasts. They're working to change structure. And Trish's research is on, on what's happening at the cellular level in fascia um, uh, under different conditions. And, um, and I was so excited that she was going to come um, and is still here and could see your work. So now it's time for questions. Um, sure. Would somebody like to step up and ask a question? Or not, that's okay too. <laughs> yeah, we, we believe Bob, that's what's Bob, happening. Bob Cohen yes. and oh, Fiona yeah. McCavitt are, are lined up. So Bob, go ahead. Oh, many, okay, now. <laughs> yeah, now we got a lot. <laughs> You're muted, hold on. There you go. Great. Great presentation, Mary. And I would just at the end, I was just thinking just a relevancy for, for myself is I have a friend that has a is having a similar problem with, with tone and instability who's a spinal cord patient. So I'm assuming that a lot of the different um, things that you're using, I see are directly applicable to that population as well. But can you care to extrapolate um, some materials from other populations besides um, um, people with or children with CP? Yeah, the... the um... Honestly, this is this is the extreme and it's easy to see, right? And that it's what I do. So I wouldn't I wouldn't have pictures to show you with spinal cord, you know, injuries or anything related to that because I don't I don't usually work with that population. Sure. I somehow became but but honestly, I 
that is something when we when we discuss our cases, for example, in our course, and we are we are talking about regular like I could take Fernando's case, woman, beautiful woman, and find pretty much the same of what I find in my kids. It's just that it's not too extreme that that you can you it's obvious to you, right? But the truth is it wasn't obvious to me either, right? It, you you have to learn to me, one thing is I'll always film because it's impossible that you can see this when you are when you are with the patient, it's always you you know you you have so many information coming from your hands, from the experience, from everything. But if you take videos and then you go back to those videos, that, that's where you can identify where are the places that are not holding. And it's um it's a a, a collapse or a, um I'm missing a word here, but it's okay. It's gonna come. Uh, it's it's a folding that is happening in places that shouldn't shouldn't happen, and you can see that. Uh, in walking, you can see that in like, but you have to, you have to, instead of look for what it's tight. Okay, this tightness is coming from somewhere. And the other thing I have to say this, I've been working very closely now with Dr. Brad Fullerton. Brad Fullerton, ha he's a um, um, physiatrist that does prolotherapy, okay? And prolotherapy has the same concept. They're activating fibroblasts, that's what they're doing, right? Right. So it was, and the whole the whole sequence is, is in the Tea Party of the archive because I first met Brad in that Tea Party that he had, and I went like wow, and then I asked Susan, Susan, let's put these two guys talking together. So we did another Tea Party between Leonid and Brad and me, and I've been working for like a year and a half now every month with Brad with one of my kids, and it's the same like how you assess looking for what is thinking about at integrity. That's that's the key here. Like I'm not a, I'm I'm moving away from range of motion. I'm moving away from tight muscle. I'm moving away from if I move here, what move and where, and what do I need to do with my hands to stabilize? So if I do it again, that it's that is not happening, and that's how the, the assessment is guided. So it's it's beautiful, honestly. It's um. And when you stabilize in those places, that's what stimulates the fibroblast for you know no, for I, activation. I, I do it. I do it just to test the the active the whole activation. It's a lot longer process. Like these kids, their parents are working two or three hours per day on a very specific way with soft tools to to get this. It we are talking about mechanotransduction here. That's what we think. That's what we believe. Right. We are uh, through mechanotransduction and fluids flow. We're waking up those fibroblasts that might be dormant somehow. That's what we believe. Great. Thank you. Uh, Fiona. Thank you. Just a, a kind of a brief question about the tone of the muscles, how you, the, the abdominal thing really brought it home for me, changing the abdominal tone um, and how it felt. So um, the, and how you, if I understand this right, that the, when you see high tone in the, person's system that's actually to overcome yeah. a significant yeah. weakness in the system and without the neurological part of cerebral palsy it, what came to my mind was most people's upper trapezius muscles are actually not strong enough and therefore they're in high tone with, with am i right there is that a yeah, good yeah, yeah. high tone in this case i mean we always blame the brain for the spasticity of these kids and now we know that there is an, a non-neurological component of the spasticity that I believe this is where it fits in. And I have seen, like, yeah. I I don't, like, not all of them because it's hard to move away from everything that is offered out there. But I do have some hardcore parents that they only do this and they don't do Botox and they don't do stretching and, they, and these kids, the tone, they start like this and then they go like, boop, after a year. Right. So it wasn't really the brain or was a, a compensation. Um, I have because I knew this que question will come. So let me quickly um, show show I had prepared a slide <laughs> for this. Because this was an, this happened in one of my assessments and I was this is such a good explanation of what the. Um, hold on, here it is. So this is the same boy. OK, this is a little bit. Uh, Later, can you see the screen? 
Can somebody confirm that you're seeing the screen? We or can no? see the screen, but it's black, Mariana. Okay, so then no. Let's try again. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So this is part of the test that I do with the kids. And I want you to see this. He is not that he's super relaxed, but I want you to pay attention to the legs. And what I'm asked, what I do here, I tilt him. So we're coming from sitting. I tilt him to the left and then I'm asking him to come up. Okay. So I want you to see. Oh no. Sorry. Never mind. Oh, so sorry. It's not playing the video. Okay. Listen, I'm gonna do it for you, but trust me, that's what happened, okay? The moment, the moment I pull him up from the arm, when he was about to start doing that effort to come up, the legs went like this. And then the head went up and then he came up, right? So when he was balanced with that weight bearing there, me not pulling and not asking for, he was relaxed. Those adductors were relaxed. The mo and that's that's something that happens with every every child with specificity. You they're relaxed sitting in the chair. The moment you, they want to talk, they go like and the whole tone kicks in, right? And if and that changes in the office if you just hold the, the, the torso. If you just give a little bit of tension around or compression, that's a that's a discussion Dr. Levy and I always have because I keep not doing it, making it right, the right, the right choice. When I offer that support with my hands then they don't use as much as tone. Okay, so, and if you see videos, I am Venezuelan and I moved to Canada and I wanted to learn how to skate on ice. And you have to see my videos that very first time, I looked like a child with CP. I was so tight because I didn't have that, you know, the stress it in my body. So I used tone to stabilize. I was literally like my, my, I was internal rotated. I was like this, like it, you have to see those videos. So we use tone, I believe to bring stability to the system. Good. Great. Okay. Jillian. Brilliant. Brilliant. Hi everyone. I kind of have like a two part comment and question for Mariana. I just, I'm an occupational therapist and I work in a school for children with multiple disabilities. A lot of them have CP, um, but also like muscular dystrophy and, and there's a whole spectrum. And I see them three to 21. And I found Mariana a couple of years ago and I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your passion with the world really and getting this whole theory and your program out there because Seeing them from three to 21, I can see and speak on how each of our students get three physical therapists, three physical therapy sessions a week, two OT, two, three OT every week speech for, you know, three to 21. And we see this progression and they don't get better, really, right? We, they need surgeries, Botox, all these things that we see with traditional approaches. And after seeing the changes that Mariana using these principles have been able to provide for these families, uh, it just really touches my heart. And I'm so excited. She's given me the opportunity to um, trial these therapies with my students. So I just wanted to say thank you so much because I really feel like this is such a life-changing opportunity for them. And, thank you, uh, Jillian. Honestly, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let me just share with with everyone here. Jillian contacted me a, a few years ago, and and we I think we did a presentation. I forgot. I guess for the whole school board, right? Yes. Yeah, that was a, that. Yeah, the, I, I pretty much presented what I just presented to you um, today. It was fun to see their faces. Uh, some of them were like, and some of them were like, and some of them were like, like no. So that was fun to watch, uh, but Jillian, she persisted. And now we have one child that she's gonna be using the balls every day. Um, and we did like a full assessment before, the mom is on board. So we'll see, because uh, it's uh, it's beautiful when I, like I, I've been trying to say this since the beginning, hey, this is good, it's different, please. But it's a hard, it's a hard one too. A, a hard message, especially when you are so, um, and this will happen to all of you who are interested. I think if you're already here, it's a big step 
Sorry, Dylan, I got you. You're, you're going to continue in a second. For everyone here who came to this biotensegrity conversation, this is this could be your first step. And it's not going to be easy. Okay, I found Leonid Bloom. I was seeing the results that he was showing. I took the families to go to Florida. I worked with them. I stopped doing everything. I was just rolling balls. I did all that for two years. I moved to Canada because of that. Okay, I was living and working for Leonid Bloom and I was still having fights in my head, many fights. So there was a process of letting go for a big time, like a big chunk of time that I couldn't think about physio anymore because it, it was not working. So I had to let go, bring this in and now bring the other part. And now I feel like I have a much better understanding of everything, okay? So those of you who are just starting today, take it easy. Take it easy because it's not easy. <laughs> Jillian, sorry, I interrupted no. you. <laughs> Mariana, just because, uh, just before Jillian uh, puts her question, um, uh, just a com um, something to add to what you're coming. Um, yes, it, it involves like a journey inside, some changes, but the community has grown. So mm -hmm. it's not like it was when you were alone, you, Mariana, bringing your story. You were, it's not like that anymore. So the community has grown. Yes, it will involve changes and you'll see inside in your mind, but it's different now. The community has grown. So yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I'm not the only crazy one. It's true. We are many here. We're a hundred something in, the, in this call. Okay, Jillian, sorry, continue. Well, after I first saw you, we already, even last year before we started collaborating really um, with this one student, I have sponges and some of my other students' chairs that they're sitting in all day and really just trying to apply your principles. And I've made neck collars, um, supportive neck collars with the batting for some students. And I've seen such a difference already. And even working with this one student now, the other day with our play principles, right? Having him sit on that semi-deflated ball, he was so much more erect. He was so much more balanced. We had the neck collar on. His neck wasn't sinking in as much. And it was just amazing to see that even just sitting him on that ball changed his ability to look around his environment and interact with his environment and just play as a six-year-old boy. So it was really incredible to see such a change just with that. Um, Thank you. So my question is that a lot of our students, unfortunately, have degenerative disorders, right? Like Rett syndrome, for example. Um, do you feel that applying these principles can still almost like slow progression or help slow that development of tone that we see over time develop and all of those things and that it would be appropriate to do with them as well? Yeah. I, I absolutely, I, I, I know it can help, okay? Um, of course, we know that there's un, an underlying condition that it's not a, a good one, right? Because we're going downhill no matter what. But I have uh, recently, actually, I have uh, two cases, Canavan syndrome. Um, basically, the moms come and, sell and tell me they were supposed to live one week and they're five years old. Okay, wow. or some, or or she's like one of them told me. I mean, I'm I know that tomorrow could be the last day, and and I, so I when I when I have you know told them, listen, I don't know what to promise, but let's see. I mean, let's let's hope for the best. They they actually improved posture and scoliosis in six months, and she's like she had many uh, um, respiratory complications. Always every call she would go to the hospital and now she hasn't been to the hospital in months now. So it's always like, this is the part that we have to understand. It's a system, right? And basically what we're doing, we're bringing this mechanical homeostasis to the system. And every, every piece of that system is going to do a better job if the environment is better. So we might not delete the condition, Right, but we are keeping that body in the best shape possible in in a in a very holistic way. So absolutely yes. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to continue to to work with you, and you've done so so graciously. And thank you again. And I'm excited for my students and their futures. Thank you, Jillian, for the trust. Good. 
Trish, I think you're next. I'm excited. <laughs> Hi, well, listen, thank you so much. That was really a wonderful presentation. And uh, I remember when I was training, working with cerebral palsy patients uh, at the in Montreal at the Shriner Hospital. And it's just great to see the, the whole change in approach. Um, the one question I had is uh, just out of curiosity, how do you know it's activating the fibroblasts. Has there been research done that? No. Uh, from, from our end, no. Okay. What I've learned is basically, um, because this is this is maybe a, I wish Leonid was here. Uh, when I first met them, and this is back 2008, 2009, they, they were not talking about fascia. They were talking about soft muscles. That's what they believed they were doing, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, so, like, you know, years went by and Mark Driscoll, Dr. Mark Driscoll yeah. came into the team and he was the one who suggested this is what's happening. Okay. Okay. So all the, and every time I go to the, um, you know, to the fascia Congress and they present what, what's going on with the fibroblasts when they're mechanical, they always, I, I'm for sure, you know, this more than me, like a thousand times more but there's always the, the they're putting the fibroblast from my perspective in it's like the pathology is that it's too much of the work and then there's the the fibrosis happening right yeah which to me makes sense if you're starting from a like a level at, let's say a normal level and then you're adding more that's when you're gonna get, you're gonna get into the fibrosis but if you are below that normal level then I, I believe that's what the strength is. I mean, again, I have no way to prove it. That's that's the rational that makes more sense to us and the way we word it to understand what we're doing. Um, mm. so it, it's logic, right? It's no, exactly. We haven't proved, I mean, I haven't, I don't know, at least, and I'm sure. So the, the one who brought it was Mark. I think it was before, in 2012, there was a fascia congress in Vancouver, I believe, Mm -hmm. uh, that they presented um, what would happen with the fibroblast in a flexible petri dish. I remember that very clearly. And that that stimulation was pretty much what we were doing with the tools, right? Similar to what we're doing. Uh, and then there's a whole conversation about fluids flow as well, how the fluid flow activate um, the, the fibrogenesis and all that. So, but I, I'm not the science, the science person. I'm I'm the mom, the, the, you know, work with the kids, be happy with the parents. I, I leave the science to someone else. So I'm, I'm welcoming you. If you want to do some some of this, I'm more than happy to collaborate in a way. Very good. Well, I don't do the actual fibroblast studies myself, but I think that it would be wonderful because there's a few other studies that I have done that sort of suggest this is what's happening to the fibroblasts. But um, but it hasn't been proven. And um, so, yeah, I think we need to um, collaborate with some researchers who yeah. can um, assess that one way or the other. Yeah. Anyway, thank in, you a, very in a way, uh, Trish, yeah. I, I'm going to be honest with you, because I have had many times parents, therapists, doctors asking for this and many, many attempts from my end to do a little bit of more serious research, which is kind of hard in many ways uh I, I might not be the the one to do that but in the end for me my research is my kids to be honest like and I don't care about numbers here I don't care how, how many kids I care about if I can make a difference from one child and one family that's all what I need to keep doing this right I know it's important I'm not saying that the research is not important but I feel like my role in this game is not to go out there and show with with numbers, what is happening? I I have the testimonials of the parents, and that's why all all that I care. I have parents saying, "But yes, but if you have some research, then insurance will pay for this." I get it; it's important, and it's not that I'm dismissing the research. But I I just don't when I when I look into my soul and I ask, "What is what you want to do?" I want to work with the kids. Yeah, <laughs> let, no, let the research for others, right? But I mean, that's that's me. But thank you, thank you, anyways. Good. Well, this is a this. Is is why the Fascia Research Congress originally was convened, so that the clinicians who didn't want to do the research and the researchers could get together on a similar platform and talk to one another and have discussion. And sometimes that works very well, and sometimes it doesn't work so very well. 
But um, I, I, I think everybody would agree that Mariana, your contribution is very, very powerful. And um, as other people have said on the chat now, you just need a good collaborator to, mm -hmm. to get in touch with your parents and be willing to, to take some of the data. But well, yeah. we've reached the end of the time. Uh, we're, we're ready to take a little break here. It went very, very fast for me. I don't know about you. Um, <laughs> It is now time for the um, the bio break for just ten minutes, yeah. and um, and then when you when we come back, um, Bruna is going to give us some movement um, instructions from a biotensegrity point of view, and it's guaranteed to be very interesting. So, uh, we'll see you here in ten I, minutes. I have some announcements before we go, and I, I'm going to leave the information on the screen as we're gone for the break uh, regarding. Okay, some resources for you, okay? Let me just go like this. And hopefully this will work. Are you seeing my screen or are you seeing the presenter? You're seeing the presenter, let me display. Are you seeing my screen now? Carol, yeah. can you confirm? Okay, yes. okay. so these are the, the resources that are, are there for you. First of all, the Biotensegrity Archive. And Stephen Levin Biotensegrity Archive is a beautiful um, place to to be in contact with, to find the, all the what is published there. These the, They are the ones who do the tea parties and the YouTube channel is full of videos that you can watch and watch and watch for hours and hours and hours. So that is there too. I, I sorry, I, I missed the link here. I'll, I'll I put all this in the chat as well, okay? Embody Biotensegrity is a platform that Cliss Clancy runs. And this is a beautiful place as well to learn is, is open to every professional or experience or artist, whoever wants to learn about biotensegrity, this is a beautiful place to be. We PTs, and when I say we, it's um, Kutu, Carol, Eileen, Kimi, Camila, Pedro, who else am I missing? Me? We're eight in total. Uh, Bruna, Bruna, sorry, I'm Bruna. We, we had this group that we were talking about white integrity for fun, and then we decided to do something useful with this. So last year, we launched the first cohort of the course for physiotherapists. And this year in April, we're opening a second um, a second group. So you're welcome to join us if you want. And of course, the books here that we have as reference always in our desk is Everything Moved by Susan Laura Solorzano. Biotensegrity, the Structural Basis of Life from Graham, who is also here. Thank you, Graham, for being here. Marenz Dill, she this book is one of the for my for my when I was having this fight in my head between biotensegrity and the rest, coming to a horse book was such a good move because I couldn't relate anything to horses because I didn't know anything about horses. So it was a very easy way for me to get into biotensegrity without, without having that fight in my head. So I truly recommend this one. And of course, Danielle Cla uh, Martin, Living Biotensegrity is another good one. Okay, so I'll leave these resources here. I'll put the links in the chat and we have 10 minutes before we come back, okay? Great. And let me just mention one real quickly that we're opening the course. Uh, the next opening of the course is in April, April 19th, for OTs and PTs this time, and OTAs and PTAs. Yeah. Okay. Good. See you in 10 minutes.
Okay, we're coming back together now. And um, as we reconvene from the break, we want to invite Bruna Petito um, to come lead us in this session of how biotensegrity informs the communication of movement practices. Okay, Bruna, would you like to introduce yourself and take over? And Mariana, could you sp spotlight her? Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm Bruna Petito. I'm from Brazil, living in the US. And I'm a PT that works um, through the awareness of the movement to regulate the system. So basically, I work um, almost all online um, and through the movement. I have some tools, but today we are going just to explore um, the movement in our body. And today I'm going to invite you to experience um, a simple and practical movement about how biotensegrity um, informs the communication of my work called Inner Balance. And it's not about exercise, it's more about a movement exploration and how this can be a way to connect the whole system and integrate the body. So I'm going to invite you all to and stand up and if you feel ready to do it, um, or you can do it um, sitting as well. And if you want to um, turn on your camera, it's going to be awesome to see you um, move, you're moving in the space. Perfect. And we are going to start just um, taking a moment to notice ourselves and our body. And asking your body if, if the body has something to say to you instead to put some idea, some um, posture. You don't need to do much. And as we notice ourselves, start to give attention what your body wants to give it attention with. So maybe it can be your feet on the ground, or maybe can be your contour on space, even your heartbeat or your breath, or maybe one feeling or one emotion. And I'm going to invite you to bring your hands on top of your head. And just give it a time to this hand, feel the connection with your body. And also for your body, receive the weight of your hand. We are going to imagine our feet grounding on the floor and almost as your whole, whole posture is start to get more um, aware of this connection about your feet grounding and your weight in your hands through your head. And just notice this weight and try not to find fight with the gravity or with holding something. And maybe this weight starts to communicate with your body 
and change some directions or some state? Is that possible to feel a gentle movement happen in your body just to relate these two connections of your feet grounding in your weight in your head? And we are going to start to notice our breath. And start to ask yourself, when you breathe in and breathe out, is something happening with your body? Or can allow your body to gentle, condense, and expand almost as we can get more expand our body and condense. And you don't need to do in one pattern. So can be when you breathe in or breathe out, yours is just your body understanding this connection. You can leave the hands in your and rest in your um, sideways. And just notice if we can imagine this relationship with your body and your head in connection with your feet. And maybe now when you breathe in and breathe out, we have more room to get some space. And I'm going to invite you to notice your, your posture, your spine. And can we imagine this spine as breathe in and breathe out, this spine just condensing a little bit and expand. And maybe can allow this movement in your spine go through your feet and feel the same idea with two little springs on your feet condensing and expand. And my question is, is that the movement happening between your head and your tailbone? Maybe a gentle nod with your hand, with your head, or maybe a gentle movement in your pelvis. And we are going to imagine this gentle spring starting to investigate in yourself. So can I bend my spine with this idea in relationship our head and our pelvis, our tailbone? can be side to side or can be front and back. That is not linear movement. So explore it and try to understand what your body needs. And maybe there is some movement happening with my knees bending Or maybe my hands want to reach something or not. And we are going to get this movement smaller, smaller, smaller 
until almost stop in the outside and stay in the inside. I'm gonna bring a uh, image that a uh, running water going to your head and just going front back, side to side. And notice if this water is more running in your front side or in your back. And if, if you are noticing something different, notice if your posture changes just to notice this water in your body. And a gentle, windy is going to start to invite your body going front and back. So I have a wind going back to forth and forth to back. And can we imagine this relationship between your head and your feet reaching front and back. And my question is, what is holding your body? Or is that possible to allow ourselves to adapt and go into one step ahead and come back? So I sway front and back and there is a time that suddenly I step with one foot and come back. And then I come back to the sway and this sway go more than I expected and I step from and come back. And give it a chance for your body find a rhythm to go for and back. And notice if this front and back, your body is just going to one side or if there is a possibility to find a gentle spiral in your body. If your foot, there is a changing of weight and give it a chance to press the ground and change your relationship with your body. And the question is, maybe it's more about adapt our body in the environment, then hold ourselves in one position. And if you feel that time, I'm going to invite you to just walk in your space. Even this space is little, that's fine. Just start to walk just a little bit. And as you walk, Notice if there is one foot to allow your body to change your direction and your position. And if this play with your feet, invite your body to swing your arms. We can remember the feeling about the spine every time I put my front feet, foot, sorry, on the ground. Notice if you have more balance. And 
and we are going to make a palm. And just come back to notice what our body has to say for us. If there's some difference in the position of your feet, or if your space to breathe, to breathe is different now. And even your position, is your posture are in the same way that we start? We can notice the relationship of our core and see if it's more alive, your belly, even we didn't do much. And feel free to um, put in the chest or say something aloud. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Bruna. That was beautiful. It, was, it really is embodied biotensegrity is what you're talking about. It's feeling within the body, the tension and compression. And I love the Hoberman sphere and then the slinky up and down and feeling that on the spine and just paying attention to that. And then Eileen came in and said, I feel more alive. So it does bring about a, and Camilla more spacious and joy. So thank you very much, Bruna. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, it's time now to move to our third presentation. And um, what I thought I knew about biotensegrity, and I'd like to welcome Stacy um, Barros to the, to the spotlight. And uh, Stacy, if you would um, introduce yourself and, and the, the stage is yours. Well, what a great uh, following to have all the people before me. And um, yeah, the topic that we'll be talking about in a moment, I just want to also um, extend my gratitude to everybody that's here because I think it does um, recognize that you have some curiosity, you may want to see what there is that you want to learn, and we call it the growth edge. And I like that because um, there is an edge to growing. And it's really the what I'm passionate about as a physical therapist is that I love um, challenging my thinking and my thought process. And along my way, I was ex um, introduced to a form of somatic education. I'm a physical therapist. I, I knew I wanted to be a PT when I was in high school. You know, my husband thinks I'm an enigma because who knows who wants to be something for their whole life. And I am passionate about it. And I love being with like-minded, passionate people like this. So I, co I totally get you. I get everybody here. I felt the tears that we saw a little bit before that. So what I thought I would share is my journey. And um, so let's see how this goes. Okay. So um, what I thought I knew about biotensegrity, I, I love this, this vision because I think I narrowed it down. I, I was so lucky to be introduced um, way back when, 2011. And I, this wonderful woman, Maureen McGew, who's a Feldenkrais practitioner who introduced me to it. And I love that I reached out to her after all this time and said, hey, guess what? I'm working with this group. I'm so excited. And, and she goes, well, I thought I'd share with you that Stephen Shafarman, I hope I pronounced his name right, um, was who introduced her. So I see him here and I wanna give a hats out to, off to you. And uh, he's got a fabulous book, Awareness Heals. I refer to it all the time. So, so anyway, so that was kind of my beginnings. But what I really wanna show is this very goofy timeline. And I feel like 
that was back in 2011, 2012. And I, I just kind of was floating along, you know, trying to, and I'll come into what was happening in between that time. But I happened to catch this beautiful woman right here, you recognize, Dr. Carol Davies. And she spoke at our California chapter for the Physical Therapy Association. And she was passionate. She talked about her journey, her background with, um, with John Barnes, with fascia, with, with just her growth and her, and it, and it just moved me so much. And obviously she talked about biotensegrity. And um, I just, and she, you know, we chatted later and she mentioned, you might be interested in this physio group. And I, I just thought, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. So then, um, but, but that aligned me to want to reach out to, um, to, to see if they're interested to hear about the Feldenkrais method and somatic education. And I'm, this is not to take it in that direction, that's for another talk. But um, it was along that way that I thought, well, I better, you know, if I'm going to mention biotensegrity, I better make sure I'm, I'm, I have a better understanding. So I reached out to Dr. Stephen Levin, who is beyond gracious and generous with him, with his knowledge. And he pointed me to Mariano, Mar Mariana, and Mariana, again, what they all did is they didn't give me simple answers to my questions. And that was where the candle or the flame lit up. And that's that jump in the curve. And if you look at the curve, it goes on. So what I thought I knew is an oversimplification, I believe. And I thought I had a really good embodied understanding of functional anatomy, um, but I hadn't let go of old school anatomy. I, it, it comes to, I come to find out. And I don't think I integrated it into the, the way I was actually you know, working in my 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 clinical self. I'm also Pilates certified, and so I I love the idea of, you know, taking on new paradigms and different pedagogy to come back to the idea that how do we learn? And so, what was beautiful is the things that I I was re remembering as I was going along. I was nodding my head when I I caught the class halfway through. And fortunately the modules were there and I was like binging. I was out of control. I was, it was like, it was a Netflix series. I was, you know, catching up on all the courses and people were trying to slow me down. But I started to realize that kinesthetic learning was so much about building off experience. And what I was hoping to share with people is, you know, something that is, is in that framework. And that's difficult as a physical therapist. We are so driven to you know, have a diagnosis and work off that clinical uh, protocol. Not all. I mean, it, it, I don't mean to oversimplify that, but but I think we we do all share a passion to help people uh, find their way and to develop. You know, wh where where they can go. And I think we can't step into everybody's experience, but we have to know what a beginner's mind and how that is for each person and that we are self-organizing systems. This is a beautiful woman, Susan Harper, who takes her thinking into a, a whole different way with, with continuum. And that's all about the, the tensegrity and, and the relationship to the, our biotensegral selves. We're just not machines, we are dynamic. And we have a real, you know, really good way of developing that thinking. So here's a beautiful picture. and. Again, you know, it, I think this is what we're offering here for you all today is that, and this has been mentioned through multiple talks, is that we're here to help support this growth, this learning that has started by this wonderful uh, orthopedic surgeon. But the other thing is that we come from a, a variety of background. Uh, we are somatic teachers. We are, um, you know, Barnes uh, pr practitioners. We're uh, Traeger practitioners, we have so much that we, what I like about that is that we can all come together and discuss the science together. We can have different applications, but we can do these things together, but we're curious. And, and the challenge is sitting with the not knowing. And that is, you know, the Feldenkrais background is very Eastern influence and it's really about the path is the goal. And I want to really give a nod also to Susan Lowell de Solorzano, 
sorry, um, because the path is the goal. And one of my favorite teachers, Dr. Ruthie Alon, re she references biologic optimism. And that is the, that's the key. That's the thing. I, I walk into each, each situation with somebody realizing that I have something that they can optimize. They have something and I can't presuppose I know what it is. So I have to team with that person. I have to make sure that I am within the system with them. I am not trying to do something to them because then the emergent properties that may be found may not necessarily come from within. The all, and that obviously includes the environment and a few things. So and so so that stepped me back into this idea of making mistakes. You know that is also part of our learning, and we embrace that. So this was my second go around. Actually, I built an icosahedron back in 2011. You know, but I didn't I didn't embody it, and I love that I made mistakes with this because it made me even more appreciate that unless those things are really having that tensile relationship to the members, it just doesn't seem to, you know, have that same kind of effect. So what I'd like to point out to you is that it seems to me that we will benefit so strongly from this science that we will be able to talk across disciplines and be able to uh, recognize how we can come together for the sake of really helping people find their way. So this was uh, something that was taken from, um, you know, Susan's book, which by the way, that to credit again, the class, what the class offered me, and it was the discipline of going through the book of um, Susan's book, uh, chapter by chapter through uh, the modules of learning. She's a kinesthetic teacher so, so fabulously. So it's really about how do we how do we really engage our self image? We we have to make sure that we still stay in that beginner's mind, and we can still reference all the learning that we have. So the other so I really just want to hone in on this idea that you know being an evangelist, which is kind of where we are together. I I thought that I could talk about this in, um, you know, by bringing a study to, you know, the reference and, and that just didn't seem to uh, catch on. That was, that was back in 1995. So it was really, you know, the next step for me was looking at, and, and not to go in this off direction a little bit, but it was looking at foam rollers because we use tools a lot in the clinic. And I, um, I wanted to present how I have returned to understanding how I look at foam rollers from a more biotensegral relationship and how I was introduced to them. And then I would like to help you reimagine foam rollers so that we can kind of look at this and, and have a dialogue and a conversation. I don't want to be in a vacuum thinking these ways. So this is Dr. Feldenkrais, and he is documented as the first person to bring these are called ethophone foam rollers. They're six inch by 36 inch. The truth be told, he had hard wooden rollers when he was in Israel. And when he came to the States, those things weren't really practical and they used this packing material. And so, well, what about these? So, but, so when we were in the Feldenkrais training, we, would did, we did four years of movement puzzles to really, really, really soften our, our, our selves in a way through there are sensation and our awareness through movement. And so when I was on these firm rollers, I had a very different experience. And so back then they weren't out on the market. And I started thinking, well, I'm a PT. I get, you know, using tools. This makes a lot of sense. We've seen the Swiss balls. We've seen, you know, that was what they're called back then. But I could see a place for this. So they weren't really there. And I decided, well, you know, people didn't have what I had as an experience in a Feldenkrais training. So their sense of their bodies may not be quite there. And the modern body is bent over most of the time. So to put people on a full six inch roller really put some contrast where they really were put themselves into end range. So I set out to reshape it not to take over the, the foam rollers, but to just bring this idea forward. And there is this yin yang approach. So I kept the shape and I just, I just kept playing with it. I um, literally 
kept, my husband would carve it each time and I would lie on it and I would lie on it to the point where I could see, we, we kept the, the same arch so that it had the manifestation. So you had a choice, one or the other, but we shaped it where I didn't want to compromise breathing. And I, and I kept seeing this. And that's why I put my son on it one day and came home and watched. And I realized, well, that, that actually interferes with breathing. So to me, that just didn't, that didn't resonate or make sense. Now I look at that and I realize, wow, that intuitiveness about it was based on biotensegrity, I believe. So I'm very interested in anybody, you know, talking about this. So wandering back, if we look at how tools are really, we our first tools are through a child manner. And so oh, these God, are some beautiful, God, sweet beautiful. things where people just Gently have kids to play on their toys. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a So I'm excited that we saw baby live in the earlier presentation. I actually toyed with even bringing her on for myself because she has gotten more likes out of any YouTube that I've seen. And baby live, when you saw the baby that uh, Fernando was uh, showing the video of, that was a Feldenkrais teacher who also was a videographer. And that was watching her baby, the, her client's baby, go through the fundamental stages in development of watching how important it is to look at orientation, to look at self-regulation, to look at curiosity, to look at uh, the importance of rest. We know that rests are really important for consolidation and learning. And so I was introduced to foam rollers to have them as a catalyst to help create conditions for learning. And through what I discovered unintentionally when I reshaped the roller, that it actually had this rocking manifestation to it too. And so I, and I, back at, back in my really early PT years, I, my, one of the clinical instructors I had was, was trained with sensory integration, which was Dr. Jean Ayers. And so we, we, there was so much exploration about rocking and uh, how that affected uh, that the bioplasticity of the children. And, and then I just started thinking, well, that's really interesting. This actually has a writing mechanism, a rocking mechanism. So what would happen is I would, with, in Feldenkrais, we set conditions up for learning. We, would, we often use a contrast and compare. And I love this quote, we are more like machine, we are more machines, we're more like living streams. So when you have somebody lie on the floor and make, you know, give them a sensorial scan, let them get the, the, the landmarks of sensation, give it time. We can't just jump over things. If, and it ha it's important that we really keep them in comfort because we don't want to override the sensory feedback, the sensory data of what they're doing. Then you, you, whatever, I actually have a recommendation of how you can explore this on your own to come into this idea, but then you can have them just lie on the cylinder or, or actually I prefer breaking it down to a much smaller space because for these reasons, and you have them just rock side to side, then it becomes an observing tool. You get to watch and, and because it's surprising how much PT, adult, I work with adult PTs, and the research that we did was based on, because I was so much involved with the Arthritis Foundation, so we had a lot of looking at pain modules. So by the time I see the adults, they have been told so many ways that they're supposed to be, all the way through the rise of a, of an, a, a nice parent trying to get them to have better posture, but they keep telling themselves. They have so many unconscious habits. So when you have them walk in, you know, in a hallway, it takes a while for them to even understand what is an authentic movement for themselves. So when I get to watch them on 
something like a smart roller, which was the name was designed because of that innate wisdom, I get to see, well, well, where is that? Where do they lose that relationship to themselves? And what's their breath like? And what do they integrate the movement of their head? And you can pretty much see their story and see, you know, do they have symmetry? Do they? And I, I love that. And then I have them break as little contact with the roller and to bring themselves back to the floor in such a way that I don't want to disturb any changes that might have happened with what they just did. So I, I use a lot of metaphors. I want you to think about that your liquid, your the, the, the roller is like a spatula. I want you to slowly let your system mate the floor. This is in real time. And then I ask the same questions. And each and every time, they most people still feel where the roller was. So that gives me a conversation. And then I can talk that, to them about the whole system that that's, the cent that's probably the central axis of you. And so rather than being straight or working on their posture is where can their left and right sides, back to that child relationship, to marrying the left and right side so that their relationship when they're in the vertical starts to really hone in on that. And also just have them notice what happened. And this is to me was, again, it was so exciting for me as I'm taking the, the physio course is that I kept thinking, I thought it was about a brain reaction that these body, the body not body schema, but the body image was reshaping because of a variety of things. And then I realized when we played with our oobleck, I think I said that right, but when we played with our kinesthetic toys and felt how you know, non-Newtonian physics was changing in liquid and then form, liquid and form, I realized, oh my gosh, that is what I'm seeing. It is a state change relating to that. So that's what I would love to encourage people to explore. So. And that just got me going because it took a long time to get this out there. And by the time the smart roller was out there, everybody had the regular cylinders, but they used it in a way that they know how to use things. And that was to therapy, therapy eyes it or do it so that it's fitness driven or balance challenge. But they never, I don't see them really using it with that, this kind of uh, attunement to sensing themselves. So I, while I was waiting for it to happen, I cut them up in pieces and then, then I had things for them to sit on. And I, again, just creating, Feldenkrais taught us how to create a lot of movement puzzles to help refine, you know, our body awareness to what we're doing. And so I just kept doing, you know, a variety of things. I, with the links, I could make a caterpillar roller and it was all for my own entertainment, of course, but then, <laughs> So then you could stand on them, you could work with state changes in walking. And then I brought them into educational programs because kids needed a little bit of downtime. You could put them near a corner and let them just do a little bit of quick walking in place. But but the, I, when I got them out there, I thought everybody's gonna know what to do with these things. And then I realized they don't because they, you know, the company that, that distributes them said that, you know, everybody thinks they're nice, but they don't know what to do with them. So. My hope is that they'll have a biotensegrity knowledge sometime that we don't just use smart roller tools, but we use our environment back to the sense that nature brings us to allow us to have a full self image because that's what we operate out of. So my thank you to you is if I will try and put it in the chat I'd love for you to try what Ruth, Dr. Ruthie Alon gave us, which is how you can roll up a blanket and make your own smart roller. And it's it's it travels with you there. I have so many people, you know, as physical therapists, we love self-care. We love things that people can do for themselves. We love. And so basically you roll up a blanket, you do a body scan, you have them get on the roll blanket. If for any reason, and a lot of times that may be the first way I introduce the concept because the whatever roller shape, soft, hard, whatever it is, may still be too much. And you always want to meet them where they're comfortable, where they have a sense of exploration to, to work forward. 
So hopefully that wasn't too fast of talking. Thank you, Stacy. So now, what would you say about what you used to think about biotensegrity and what you know now is true? Thank you. That, that was what was missing right there was the summary. So I think where I am is that it, first of all, I don't know if it was showed on the graph, the line went off the page and it's not a flat line, it's a slow rise. And so for me, it just continued to open up understanding the human condition more. It's not about an architecture. It's not, it's, it really, um, I, I, I think what I really learned was I was reverting back in my own sensation, my contact with my clients, because when I started to really use the model, the biotensegral model, where I put it somewhere, and to really, really keep it in my sense of self, mm -hmm. I could really bring myself back to what I believe was to be there to accompany my clients in a way for them to learn and to sense their own integrity without interfering from me. I understand. So you you took a back seat as a practitioner and you allowed the patient or the client's um, understanding and environment and response to be the driver for the treatment session. Yes, right. yes, exactly. And I, I just want to point out that like Mariana, my journey has been long, but the excitement is always comes out when I can learn something I don't necessarily I didn't know before, and I I it, it's hard to sit with that, but but we can appreciate that if we're here for this opportunity to have something which I believe is the ultimate cutting edge of understanding human anatomy, movement, and all of the above. It's it's definitely I I couldn't be more excited to be a part of this and to to see it grow will be exciting for all of us. It it also strikes me that you approached this um, idea of un wanting to understand this different science better from your functional from your um, a functional awareness background in Feldenkrais. And so what you were looking for was more of an understanding of what happens in embodied biotensegrity, in the inner kind of awareness of the, of the model of, of continuous tension with intermittent compression and how that's manifesting yeah. itself in what patients then report to us is happening. Is that true? Yes, and, and I think um, in truth, you know, it, my, my background actually prior to being a PT was a competitive athlete. And I, I, with the Feldenkrais method, I was humbled to realize how much I didn't know in my own body. So that was the first element. And that's why it was such a, a hallmark of appreciating the, the unknown in my own self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And then that also through that allows me to have an open mind. And I really think that growing edge it is so important to have that open mind and having a way. And so, so what, what, you know, I tend to, to be considered out there, you know, with my PT colleagues, because mm -hmm. it was, I understood their confusion and I understood them well, just give me, what did you do for this patient? And, and when I see how we've kind of paced this to explain that I didn't look at them that way. And so it, it, it's been a hard, you know, path. So when I stepped into this group and I realized this is, this is the way to talk about it. Even, you know, my husband who's had to live alongside me all this time said, 
this is going to help you talk about what you've been talking about. And he's absolutely right. And I, I feel it. I feel it in the integrity of working with clients. I, I can sense it because I think I, I didn't want to give up on PT, but I needed a new paradigm. There's no doubt. And so this fulfilled that for me. And I really believe you know, we're going to watch a lot of other types of practitioners grab this faster. If we don't get on the train, we have to get on this train. Well, it really is the science, isn't it? That's catching up to all of us from wherever our framework is that we find ourselves when we make a discovery. And some of us yeah. start with it from manual therapy and some of it start with from movement therapy um, uh, orientation. Um, but but what I'm reminded of is the the stark difference between be like a curious cat, which is what John Barnes taught me a long time ago. When you go in to see your patient, be like a curious cat. Whereas in physical therapy, what I learned was read read the patient's chart, um, go through all the systems and that you can see in the chart, and then take a really in-depth history and put together an analysis and then through your left brain um, and what the research tells you to do, then you do that and you and you look to see if there's a, a result, if, the, if there's an outcome that the research um, showed you probably would happen if you did it correctly and if you followed these rules. And that's such a different model, different framework toward looking at patients and clients than the one that you presented here, that curiosity about you got your son on the foam roller and you didn't think that his, his shoulders could open enough to really breathe as well. And so you redesigned the roller so the shoulders could drop back and the person could breathe better. Is that correct? Absolutely. And you know, what's funny, like I said, it took a long time you saw that purple, that, that, pro, that product failed. That was our original prototype. But in the meantime, I got to slip them under a lot of people. That was my, my R and D. And what was interesting at one, and then the, the, the regular rollers showed up. And what I did is I thought, okay, well, let's just see, you know, I'll slide one under and slide one. And I just kept asking people, what do you notice? What do you notice? What do you notice? And what was the common thing that happened was when they were on the white roller, they said, oh, I feel the stretch. And I said, oh, okay. And then when they say, when they get on the purple roller, they go, oh, I, I, I feel so comfortable. And I was, I realized that reinforced my thinking. I wanted, I didn't want them to feel the stretch. I wanted them to have comfort so that they could embody the relationship in their environment. Mm -hmm. And I also realized they liked whichever one they were just, they were introduced to first. Yeah. And I think that is what's, fascinating getting back to the clients as animals right you know it's like i didn't get i don't have true beginner's mind with that because the six inch rollers is out there and uh and even when i would have them do the rocking motion as a beginning thing i'd see them come back and they would they would lie on the marble side which prohibited the rocking which is fine there's things i do it's it's not meant to be a fix it thing it's meant to just discover things so three awareness, so awareness I, movement yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I, I would say what do you notice you know why why did you choose that side you mm -hmm. know and it was interesting because they that you know more is better in their thinking their feedback at least that that prominent protrusion was something they wanted and i said okay well yeah. let's mm -hmm. let's go there. we could talk about that we could we could see you know what that relationship letting go of was. the outcome right yeah great yes yes definitely mariana you have a question no just an idea that came um because at the very beginning someone asked uh, i forgot i forgot your name she asked like if if we're gonna teach core, uh, like techniques or or you know specific exercises to do and, and since Stacy like and again Stacy she took her course last year so she's and, and in a very last minute so she went through it like boom like she said as Netflix right but she's I well, correct me if I'm wrong Stacy you're still doing your you're still doing the same of what you were doing before but because now you have this understanding of bioinsecurity you can one, you can explain 
in a different way that it suits you better, maybe what you're doing. But also now you're thinking like, like what, what you just said about the, the water and the soft matter and all that, it's just giving you images that can give you even more ideas of what to do, right? So see, like we don't have to change. In my case, biotensibility really changed everything. Like I I'm never did what I used to do before. But it could be that you're still doing what you're doing, that is it's working, and you just have a different way of understanding and explaining what you're doing. And that offers, it opens the door to even more possibility because now you you think about, okay, but if I put this leg and you you know the push and pull, okay, what? So that I, to me, it's that, that curiosity mind and the, the beginner's mind, but it's, it's if it's always there and we're always kind of paying attention to that relationship between us, the patient, the tool that we're using, it, it, if we understand that dynamics between the elements, then we can, we, I think it's endless, the possibility. So thank you very much, much Stacey, for, for sharing what you, what you did and how you, how you felt. You reminded me of something that I did do a crash course of my version of it, but what was really exciting was at the end, we did a case study and I went back through it again. And it, it's something that I am going to repeat and repeat and repeat. I'm grateful that that's available to me because it, you know, it, it, the, the mandala is brilliant. It is so brilliant. And I thought, well, wait a minute. Why? why maybe I should make a mandala because uh, it, it just was so, I, I went through that identity challenge in my Feldenkrais training to think, well, wait a minute, do I just drop everything I know? Do I, you know, because it was so fundamentally different. And, and I, and I, thankfully I had a fabulous mentor that said, no, Stacey, you just Feldenkrais it. You just kind of build it back into the module of how would you help your clients success, succeed, succeed in whatever it is they come to you for. And so I think that's what I, I can appreciate because it's, it's so fundamentally, I, I love when you, I, the thing that kicks out really well too is everything soft matter in biologic living things. And so it just, and, and the funny thing is I didn't do the, the oobleck to the very last, last module because I knew it was gonna make a mess. And all of a sudden I'm in the kitchen doing it and my daughter walks in, she goes, oh, oobleck. And I, th I said, you know what this is? And she says, oh yeah, we did it in science in fifth grade or whatever. So I thought, Susan, you might, Lowell, you might appreciate that one that she, they, they were, they are, they get it. So it's us, you know, old school people that don't, so. Well, I, I imagine there are some people on here who don't know what Ublik is. And um, Mariana, you have a video, is that correct? That demonstrates soft matter and the use of Ublik to show how tissue or, or soft matter responds differently to pressure yep. pressure and sharp pressure versus soft pressure. Do you want to tell a little bit about that? Yeah, Ublik, Ublik is when you mix cornstarch with water. And uh, what's the prescription? What's no, the honestly, I may, there's probably one, but I don't know. I just go and mix and play with it because the more, again, if you change the quantities, it also behaves differently. But if you Google Ublek videos on or on YouTube, you go, at universities, I've seen that they fill a full pool with this a swimming pool, like yeah. a swimming pool, and 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 there. So what happens is when you, it, I mean, that's just to to explain what thixotropic is. Uh, it's the behavior. So when you hit it hard, it hardens. When you put it like move it slow, it flows, right? But these kids are walking on oblek and then standing and then they sink. So it it's fun, but I think this is the the part that. Yeah, and I, I'm in charge of the soft matter in this course. <laughs> and it's true. The moment you you change the image of what you're looking for, like if you're looking for a bone, you're going to go find that bone. And, and because we study anatomy so well, we know exactly where we're at, right? But if I'm thinking about, okay, this bone is in this system that it's all soft matter. So let me see if I can feel the bone as butter. And trust me, you're gonna connect to the bone as if it's a block of butter. And then you, you something that I always tell my parents that I work with, say, imagine that you want to melt the butter without leaving your fingerprints in, right? So I, I use a lot of images of soft matter because it, it, it makes it easier 
on her hands, right? And it's always fun. It's always fun to, yeah. So yeah, Ublek is fun. It's a way. It's a way to start understanding the human body. Right. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Stacy? Uh, one comment on on Mariana's soft matter. One thing that um, I think it's very important about this experiences with uh, with with Ublek and even the the models from the biotensegrity models is that when you feel it, like when you see and when you feel it, uh, feel with your hands, um, you you it sort of connects something inside you. You you understand in a different way, and and, and Ublek, um, they have this unexpected behaviors. I mean, the matter, the the the, the substance behaves in an unexpected way. So when you see it with your own eyes and you feel it, how it behaves, you you um, you get like more. How do you explain this? I mean, your mind can well. It can behaves differently. This things can work in a different way, and you know because biological and the body are more, much more close to this kind of materials, soft matter. So it also gets you. Oh, so we can understand how things behave in the body in a different way, and this is, um, it's very useful to have these models, even uh, both like. Um, playing with the oblique and the, the models with the strings and the, um, and the struts, right? Yeah, it opens your mind. Yeah, yeah space is yours. <laughs> Mila, did you have a question or a comment? Yes, thank you, Carol. Uh, I don't see myself, so I hope I can not check. I see you. Why mm -hmm. I'm not seeing myself, but I happen to, we, you started to talk about soft matter and I have been playing with this one since the start of Stacy's class and I just wanted to show you guys. It's a bit less messy than when you mix Ublek and you take it to classes and... Is it, what is it? Is it? It's like, in Czech it's called, it's called creative matter, it's called chameleon. That's and, silly potty. Here we find it as silly potty. Silly potty. Yes, silly potty. okay. Yes. And it's like, it has very similar behavior, but you don't make so much mess with it. Uh -huh. um, so I just, like for people who don't know that is, it's like uh, the viscoelasticity is obvious. Um, you see how it's slowly melting, but uh -huh. then I can just grab it and hit my head, hand with, not head, hand with it. And you uh -huh. can see how hard it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we actually played with it in class and um, I made a ball out of it and I hit the ground and it was like jumping around the class and then I let it sit on the ground for some time and it melted completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of fun and also as Pedro is saying, it's giving you nice feedback to how you touch and um, it's showing you that less is more. I would say, in general. Right. Um, there, there's a lot about um, biotensegrity that we can prove pretty convincingly, a little about biotensegrity that we can prove. And there's a lot about biotensegrity that we propose, that Stephen Levin proposes very articulately on his teaching modules, both on the um, on the archive uh, website and then in the YouTube um, videos. W one of the things that's pretty well accepted now, it wasn't when I was starting out, was the impact of energy on soft matter and energy in terms of pressure and also heat from our hands affecting fascia that's within the skin and underneath the skin through the um, through the concept of mechanotransduction, which is very well articulated by Donald Ingbert, I-N-G-B-E-R. And that is that there is a, um, a chemical change with the tissue of soft matter when we press on it. And in that pressure, and that's what mean, that's that's the art of what we're doing. It's the right kind of pressure to get the impact on changing 
the structure of the extracellular matrix and the ways that we think are going to be helpful for um, our patient or our client. <clears throat> and this is through um, the piezoelectric effect where electrons are flowing um, throughout the tissue and it, the tissue then responds thixotropically. Thixotropy is a, um, a, a condition whereby the fascia changes from more stiff to more compliant with pressure and also heat from the our hands, the infrared energy, <clears throat> but it also affects um, so foam rollers and balls and so forth, and soft balls as Mariana uses, affect the tissue through this mechanotransduction effect. So if you're interested in what is pretty well accepted science, I wanna give a shout out to James Oshman's book, Energy Medicine, The Scientific Basis, where he reviews a lot of the scientific protocols and, and research that shows that this, this living crystal web of fascia um, and um, is very much influenced by um, manual and movement therapy in these ways. Excuse me, scientifically um, um, pretty well accepted. So I just wanted to, to put that um, plug in for um, James Oshman's book. Are there any other questions? Or George, comments? George, do you want to come up and talk a little bit about, we, we just put in the, I don't want to put you in the spot, but if you are, please come. <laughs> Uh, he said in the in the chat that there's also significant bioelectric and photonic effects, laser, microcurrent. So all that is Fernando. But I need to be on mute. You are. Ah, you're on, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you, thank you, Stacy, and for for your lecture. I just want to say that. Uh, I was working with the great grand uh, lady, okay, with the great grand. The woman, the, the great grandmother. Years, for the woman that I saw, thank you very much in the videos. For three years until the day I saw her, the foam rolling. Okay, I wasn't. I was like kind of scared because I didn't got all the biotechnology knowledge with me. So one day I took not the smart roller but another kind of foamy material. Uh, the way I do it is uh, kind of with uh, Bruna's um, uh, uh, dynamics that we were doing, like feeling your body and all this. So she's just falling, uh, lying down on top of the of the of the roll. I do once, then she sets. We talk about it. How is she feeling in it? And then we do it again. Then she sets. When we talk again, and then she said to me, "This." should have been our first, very, very first class. <laughs> not, not the movement, not the exercise. No, no. She fell in love with the role as soon as she, as soon as she tried. So it's a very nice tool also. And of course it's happening what Carol's just described and uh, George wrote. I believe George wants to say something, so. Yes, George. Go oh, ahead. hi. I'm out shopping. So uh, thank you. Um, what I wanted to say was I want you to uh, consider like the bioelectric when you use microcurrent and frequency specific microcurrent and laser effect because piezoelectricity has two sides to that coin. Okay. You can apply an induction field, which we do with matrix repatterning and manual pressure, which creates a piezoelectric effect, both of them can influence changes in the matrix, right? So this is what uh, the Oshman, who wrote the foreword to my book on matrix repatterning, verifies, you know, and that, uh, that's something that, you know, uh, we're doing a lot of that in physical therapy, and we're doing that, you know, with the work that we're doing as well. But you have to realize that, you know, that's why they work. The infrared, the new, new studies on near-infrared, and the effects of that, and the, even things like uh, ultraviolet on the on the pineal gland, and so on, these are powerful influences on the entire fascial system, the nervous system. Okay, so that's what I was I was alluding to. Okay, does it help? Great. Yes. Thanks, George. Very much. Okay.
All right. And this this is what happens when we do our biotensegrity tea parties too. People chime in with what their understanding is of the of the science and what science they're using. Um, Mariana talked about her um, meeting up with Brad Fullerton and his work, um, and 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 coming together with different ideas about how to look at the system from this biotensegro point of view and how to see what the system's asking for, so to speak in terms of what appears to be imbalance. Uh, you know, sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we think, oh, well, because somebody's not aligned right, they're in, uh, they're not balanced right. So we wanna straighten them up and, and, and line them up. That's the old PT way. And Mariana, I think did a very good job describing to us that that's not always the case, really. What we really do need is change our lenses about this that, that fascia and the system is always working with the maximum efficiency in any one moment that it can give to us for support. And that we need to appreciate that and honor that and understand that, and then work within that system in such a way that we might be able to help rather than interfere with what the system is doing in order to support. Jillian, did you have another question? Hi, um, I found when Mariana and I were reviewing um, the student who we're working with, um, his video and looking at what his body was doing and about the tensional system, Mariana used the analogy of looking at those compartments within our torso as drums. And I just thought that that was so helpful and was wondering if Mariana, if you agree, if maybe explaining that um, and how, um, you know, when we don't have those collapses, right, we have that natural tension system that's always occurring within us. And when we see this collapse, what that is doing with those drums, I just felt like it was such a simple way to view things too with that tension and how we're looking at all the systems like with our diaphragm and our pelvic floor and how that's creating that tension every time we breathe in and out and kind of just pulls everything together. So I just wanted to kind of ask her or share Yeah, I can do that. it. I can do it. It's a, I mean, remember, please, please, everybody. My, my everyday life is with parents, right? So I'm always talking about the sponges, the, the, the butter and the jello i i never talk anything fancy because they they don't understand me and when i have parents who are doctors or uh, medical doctors or their therapists <clears throat> with them even if i try to go and explain biotensegrity they don't understand me either so i have to always go back to like simple examples and images so the message can go through so what I told, like in, in this case, this boy, it was very clear how like literally like his neck was inside his upper, upper aperture, right? It was completely, it was like this, like my shirt going up like this. And then the same was happening with the abdomen and the same was happening with the pelvis. So the example that I used to explain this, but again, this is not, this is not as simple as this. The way I, I explain this is imagine that you have a cylinder with a with a leather, like a drum that has that leather on top that and that drum, that leather is tense, properly tense. So you can actually um, play the drum properly. Right. And then you put another drum on top, another cylinder on top. And that could be the pelvis, the abdomen, the chest, and then another one smaller, which is the neck. So if I lose then all the, the fabrics or the letters of the of those drums, the drums will sink one inside the other, right? So that that's the way I see this. And it it with the kids, it's very visible. Like when when I have a child who's, for example, if I'm if I'm doing a pull to sit um test, you'll see that how they go and the, these drums they go one in like a like a piston kind of movement that goes inside and it's very clear, right? But again, it's it's this is um, a way of understanding that it's all tensional balance, and again, even when those drums are sinking, that is that is a mechanism that the child has to bring the balance to to bring the efficiency of his system good enough so he can pull up. So it's not wrong either, 
that that's a, that's something that we also it, we we have to be careful when we're using uh, the the word transegrity, and that's another. We, you, there is a tea party about this if you want to watch it, um, because the transegrity is the mod is the the explanation of this of of of, of that uh, that how you call that that event or that whatever is happening. I can use biotensegrity as the model to explain that phenomenon. That was the word I was looking for. Okay. Uh, but it is it is wrong to say that the biotensegrity is bad. The biotensegrity is not balanced. The biotensegrity, it's wrong to say that because the mathematical calculations cannot be, like the mathematics is not bad. The, the, the way I'm using that to explain could be different, right? Or the calculus that I'm doing, it's different. It's 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 good or it's, or it's bad. But the, the the science itself, the mathematics is not is not bad. Cannot be bad. I don't know if I'm making myself clear here, right? When we talk about biotensegrity, that is that is the model that we're using to explain something. And what is what is good or bad is that balance inside or that relationship that might be different or not optimal. Right, but it's not that we are. Uh, uh, sometimes I, I I always make the same mistake, saying, "Oh, it's not balanced enough." It's always balanced. It's always balanced it, because that that's a that's a, a characteristic of of the structure itself. Okay, like if I cut one of this string, immediately this model is going to find balance again, right? And that's that's the property of our body as well. They want to even if we are sick. We are still our bodies always finding that that um, less energy way of working. Most efficient way. Most efficient. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. So yes, yeah, so that's that's the example of the drums. I don't know how we, how we landed on the drums, but it's good. <laughs> it's good. Thank you, Julia. Yeah. Pedro. Pedro, what's up? Uh, I see that May uh, wants to. I want to. Um... Give my space to to May. Okay. May Kessler has joined us. May, welcome. Did May leave the floor? Oh, because we need to unmute. Sorry, sorry, my fault. There, there you, you go. Are. May, are you with us? Hi. I am, but I see that my video isn't. So, oh, there I am. Hello. Oh. Hello. Hi. So um I'm on a train, so I'm sorry if the um the the Wi-Fi might go in and out, but I just did want to share just the uh, Lisa was asking about the emotional um mm -hmm. and I do always want to share that. I mean then what I do is I always check, especially in the evaluation through every system, because you know, I never know where their issues coming from. And I know we all know that, but um, I mean, it, I've just seen it every single time. And, you know, people just come in like, it's just my hip, it's just my ankle. I'm like, no, and, you know, and then we find all the connections. And and just in terms of what that does for people emotionally, they they are sometimes brought to tears because they, they, they no one ever put it all together. No one ever, um, you know, so many times they're, they're um, almost gaslighted by other people you know, other practitioners that just like, oh, that's nothing. So um, that looking at it as a whole, as a whole tensegrity, as also as many systems working together is really how I'm looking at things now. And I'm finding that really helpful. Always checking if my hands are one part, they're always checking what's happening in others, looking um, all the way through and it really, it's just really enlightening for patients. Um, can I, uh, since I have it, I'm like, I am totally mind blown what, what happened, but I was um, working on someone who had had an appendectomy and then she had been, she didn't tell me this, but she'd been doing something. And I closed my eyes and I had an image of green little dots. And I was like, I'm gonna share, what, what have you been doing that has green little dots? And she had been bending over planting little lettuce leaves. <laughs> and that's what I got from working on her abdomen. Um, and I was just like, I don't know how this happens. Of course, we, you know, but it was, um, it's just mind blowing to me how this works. 
So that's all I'm going to say because I know I'm on a train and all this stuff, but thank you all for sharing it. So good to hear you all. Great. Thanks, May. Okay. Well, we've come now to the place in our program where we want to open up for um, the challenges of biotensegrity and early and early adopters, a group discussion. And I'm going to invite um, Camilla to join us and introduce this particular section. So Camilla, let's, let's unmute her. Thank you, Carol. So this will be, hopefully I'll make it because I'm very grateful that so many of you stayed with us for so long. Thank you for that. I'm very surprised. And also the time went passed by very fast. So that's another surprise for me here. Um, I will have another slide with the small drawings uh, to kind of wrap up the day. Uh, but we, before I do that, I would like to share a little bit about how um, our, our group actually got together. A little bit of our story uh, to give the context to what we are doing now. Uh, it was, I believe it was 2019 or 20, early 20, when we were taking deep dive to Susan's book, Everything Moves Through Her Course. And for me, it was very uh, rich experience. And I would even say life-changing experience because not just about biotensegrity, but also because of the community that I got to meet, where I learned that um, it is okay not to know some things. Uh, that there's much more that we don't know that than we actually do know. And it kind of shifted uh, what I was experiencing through the process of learning that I was always taught that I have to know, that I have to have the answers. And uh, I could see that through years of my practice, it kind of took me to to places where I saw myself that I'm not having so much fun. So this was a huge thing to experience the group that was curious about what each of us has to say, even though um, it's someone who is a beginner in, in this topic or it's someone who wrote the books. And uh, let me just say thank you to all the mentors and all the authors of the books that Mariana shared, that they are always willing to help us and give us give us. Um, uh, support when we don't understand something or when we just want to be sure if we are sharing it in the right way. And also what I learned in the in this course in the community specifically is that um, there was this art of listening, art of being able to hear each other, to give each other space. And I don't mean listening in a way that you're hearing, you're listening to someone, but you're already preparing the answer for, or the reaction, but listening where you really take a step back and give space for the different perspective that you might maybe not be seeing. And one more thing is that we got to meet because this was not a PT community, it was like open to everyone and I see that in trailblazers in uh, Chris's platform also embodied biotensegrity that there are people from different fields it's and it's it's something that I have never it's giving us such a rich complex perspective on things and I see guys like our guests Christian is here and Mike was here and so Christian is architect Mike is, and I would I would say, a uh, tensegrity wizard. Uh, Mike is a puppeteer. We got Jeremy Mossman, who is a singer. And like you could see different angles on the similar topic that's kind of infiltrated everything. So that brought, to me pers personally, like new ideas, how to apply it in our own practice. So thank you for that, everyone in the community. 
and uh, I will get to our PT community now. So during our course with Susan, Mariana came and she said, I am having, I'm teaching a class to PTs and I need some support. I need some feedback because it's one thing to talk about it in between us who actually found this path and are already curious about it. And we have this safe bubble. And another thing is to go out there and especially to PTs or medical professionals, because we are hungry for the evidence based uh, for the data, you know, for the, for, for the research. And this is relatively new for us with, when it comes to body work. So there is not much research and not many data. So she came and she was like, I need some feedback. And uh, we got this space and uh, she shared what she has prepared, had prepared. And um, we also gave her our opinions and we understood that this is something we want to do also. So that's what happened that we started to meet every single week. And we are doing that for I don't know, three, four years now. And it, how many, Mariana? Four. I, it's very hard to believe that. And for me, it's Friday evenings. So so you can imagine um, some of the reactions of my friends and family who have no idea, like, wh why are you, what are you doing? Like, what is this? And I was wondering what keep, kept us going. And it was this sense of, support and safety and another wave of curiosity during the years of practice that there is something else that we haven't seen before. So I will share that last slide with the drawings again. And please, I invite you to get back to the mandala. It's It looks very simple and playful and when we look at it, it's so clear, it's obvious. But exploring biotensegrity comes in a spiral, I would say. And sometimes you really are close to it and you have this like, okay, I get it, like it's clear. And then suddenly it's very similar topic or the same one. And you're like, I don't get this. I'm completely stuck with that. Like what's going on? And the mandala, I believe it's keeping us grounded. We always can, back, can uh, get back to it and see some topics that we uh, that that help us to stay grounded in this wide, complex field. Um, okay, let me share my screen now. Everyone, I don't see you actually, but can someone give me a thumbs up that, yeah, thanks. Let's go. Let me see a slide. The challenges of early adopters. Thank you, Carol. Mm -hmm. So the challenges of early adopters, and I didn't put biotensegrity there because I think it can apply to different topics also, but let's, let's talk more about biotensegrity. I will use my own experience also um, to, to guide me through this. So here I was as a PT, very well educated, had my degree, have my experience, learned the methods, le learned the guidelines. And I believe it was 2009 when I first saw the tensegrity model, icosahedron. And I remember very, very well that I told to myself, oh, that's that's nice idea. Like you can see how everything is connected and kind of um, moves each other. And these are bones and these are muscles and, and that's it. And I was very happy I understood it. And that was my five minute thinking process about the model. And about 10 years later, I got to hear Dr. Levin and Susan Lowell and Graham having discussion in one of the um, one of the spaces in a, I believe it was a fascia symposium, and I had no idea what they are talking about. And I was like, "This is about the 
the tensegrity thing like is it but and it was resonating somehow i knew that there is something on it but i couldn't understand some or most of it so i started to explore it i took the deep dive and i saw that i am finding some explanations to what i'm seeing in the clinical practice and i wasn't able to explain explain it before and here I want to mention uh, Czech, uh, our, one of our Czech mentors, Professor Levitt, who used to say, who doesn't understand what I'm doing, thinks that I'm doing magic, thinks that it's magic. And sometimes it looks like it, like you do something, something else happens and suddenly the person feels amazing. Um, so in some way I felt lonely because I saw this huge um, topic and paradigm that was not completely fitting into what I learned completely. Like, it was not completely opposite, but in some ways also it was. And then I found, so I was surprised, you can see that. And then I found uh, the PTs and we started to hang out every week, as I said. And in the group, we cultivated the art of listening, as I said already, the curiosity that came from the understanding that we don't know everything, that we don't have all the answers. And it is also okay to say, I don't know. And we were giving each other's feedback because they were no guidelines. We had the our mentors and the books, but we didn't have any guideline or someone who wrote a book about biotensegrity applied in physical therapy. Uh, so we were providing each other also the resources uh, to keep ourselves grounded and being uh, up to date with the topic. And from, from this place, I started to feel safe and grounded. And eventually I was able to go out and uh, think about sharing biotensegrity with other professionals who have had their own idea, their own experience, very unique ones. Each of us has a unique one. And uh, we were looking for finding ways how to communicate between each other. So it's not in a way opposition, but it's like finding the language that we have together. And what helped me to learn from our bubble, from our community, to remember that what is very useful is the soft answer, the nonviolent communication and the language, which comes from kindness, curiosity, and ability to listen. I remembered my human part, not so much the professional PT part, because that is, I believe, sometimes something that's kind of um, restricting us in hearing each other. So, um, and it might sound a bit hippie, but I think that's that's something very, very important for us to, to talk uh, to each other in a kind way and stay curious about the perspectives of, of others. So from this point, I believe this is very helpful for creating our community. We can become one big community and uh, each of you can create your own, but like, let's talk with each other and let's support feeling safe and hurt in our communities. And hopefully, and I see it already by how you guys talk to each other that, uh, that Trish mentioned the research and Jillian is cooperated with uh, co cooperating with Mariana. And so these new cooperations can bring new ideas. And what we desperately need is the research, some data, but maybe that are focused more on the quality and a bit of different way of exploring things that are unique and individually done. So we need more new ideas. And from that, I believe we can enjoy our work much more and have fun.
thank you for listening. And I really hope this will bring some uh, conversation uh, fuel. <laughs> nice job, Camilla. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Mariana, your hands up, no? No, you were clapping. Okay, yes, we're clapping. Um, some of my colleagues are here um, uh, that from the community that I was in before I was in, or a community that I was in along with my biotensegrity community. I was really introduced to biotensegrity through John Barnes. And John didn't talk too much about the, didn't say the word biotensegrity, but he did offer a chapter in his book by Steve Levin, who talked about biotensegrity. And um, I've, I soon realized uh, in 2015, when I was invited to the first biotensegrity interest group um, before the Fascia Research Congress, that um, this, this vocabulary and this language and this way of looking at, at human beings and, um, and living beings that Steve Levin teaches um, was very consistent with the way that John Barnes was teaching without using the exact words. And several people have kind of indicated that today, that they came from this from a different point of view. And some of you in the group, I think, probably can identify with me when I say, as, as soon as I graduated in 1969, it did not make sense to me at all to exercise in cardinal planes. Now, I was told that that's what I was supposed to do, to put a weight in somebody's hand and have them exercise and do straight leg raisings and, and things like that, because that's what we were supposed to do. And at the time, I was very young. I was 22, 24 when I graduated. And, and I thought, well, they must know better than I do. But I saw a physical therapist working with a patient in the parallel bars at Mass General, where I was a clinician, a young clinician. And I saw what she was doing. And she was, she was holding the patient around the waist and around the thorax. And he was sitting and she was using her own body and her, her hands and they were rocking together. And she said, now we're gonna stand up together. And I saw that she was using her whole system and in his whole system, to bring about a change in position from sitting to standing with this patient who had a stroke. That made so much more sense to me. And I thought, as soon as I saw that, I thought, I wanna learn what she's doing. And I suspect that some of you who are Feldenkrais practitioners, Pilates practitioners, somatic movement practitioners, other kind of practitioners here, and, and certainly Barnes um, and Traeger and, and Bowen and whatever else, you saw something that sparked you. And then when you did a deeper dive into what's really going on here, you recognized the principles of this new science, biotensegrity, that were coming into place as a scientific way of guiding an under, a different understanding of human beings based on systems theory and based on um, there are no straight lines and spirals and based on all the things that we teach in the course, we teach about the therapeutic relationship that the patient, listen to the patient, let the patient guide you. Um, what language are you using? So much has been said today about using metaphor, working with pa parents, you don't use scientific language. And the brain knows nothing of muscle. The brain only knows about how to interpret motion. And, and so we, we learn to change our language and, we, and, and then we, we learn the characteristics in the course about soft matter, that, that this solid state physics that we learned and biomechanics just didn't compute well. There, there were aspects of it, the angle of pole and so forth that were interesting, but really what Fernando gave us in terms of, of a new way of looking at uh, tension and compression in relationship and allowing the environment of the patient to really dictate how we're going to support, stabilize, and then allow movement and isometric and isokinetic exercise rather than concentric and eccentric um, range of motion and so forth. 
um, a concept of push and pull. We haven't talked too much about that, but the whole idea of the icosahedron and the, the tension, the constant tension with the intermittent compression, the sum of the push and pull is the biotensegral energy that it gives us shape from the nucleus and, um, and, the, and, and the microtubules within the nucleus and in the cytoplasm all the way out to the cosmos. And micro to macro, there is this system of tension and compression together that is forming this structure that allows us then to be able to have volume. And, um, and then the whole concept of fractals and um, triangles and, and spirals and chirality um, that, that nothing is straight. Everything is in, in, in spiral. From the big bang out, what we know from the big bang out, when that explosion, if you believe that this is what happened, in that explosion, what happened was gravity was a part of the system, but what happened was everything spiraled and everything came out of that spiraling, including us, if that's the perspective that you hold in your opinion about where how we were all created from stardust, so to speak, that the very elements that create the stars and the movements that create the stars that we're finding out more and more about with uh, Hubble and now the the, the James Webb telescope, that the, the, it's all spirals and, uh, and we are all spirals too, inside and then as we want to move um, spontaneously. It's always through some sort of field, never in straight lines, cardinal planes. Um, and then the concept of, of complex systems and complexity and um, Neil Thies's new book, Notes on Complexity is so relevant to what we're talking about here of systems theory, that when one, th as Susan Lowell's book says, when one thing moves, everything moves. Everything is understanding everything else within the system and working for maximum efficiency in any one um, moment. And so we take these principles and we apply them to our therapeutic process. And you saw here today, the wonderful cases that people presented from horses, and you should see Kutu's work with the little dogs, the little um, um, terriers that she works with, um, and, and uh, the, just placing our hands in a certain way to listen very carefully, and then ask, be curious, ask, what change, in, with, especially with regard to tension and compression, what change is required here to bring about a, a balance within the system. And um, then when we start to ask these questions, all of a sudden we become different. We become more curious. We start using more, as Susan Lowell says so beautifully, and, and like in Tai Chi, instead of resisting the movement, you, you bend with it. We use the soft answer. Tell me, tell me more about that. Tell me, explain to me more about what you're thinking. And, and we, we find that we're changing. And that what I realized that when I finally embraced these principles more fully through using the Barnes method of manual therapy, Barnes myofascial release, so much of what John said of finding where the person pushes back and the art and then listening carefully, not 30 seconds, not a minute, three to five to, to 10 minutes listening to what's happening with fascia as it changes under my hands. And in terms of compression, is the, is the fascia asking for more pressure and tension? I've got elongation between my hands. Is there more elongation being asked for here? And then following what the person's body and mind is asking of me, because there are some of us who believe, and I'm one, that what we're working with here is the mind, that true healing and coming, coming back into balance has to do with the mind and consciousness within the system. Now, we can't measure that. We don't know that. A lot of this is my opinion, and it makes sense to me when I'm thinking about this and feeling this in my, in my practice, and I see the changes that come about with my patients, I get very, very excited about them saying, I feel more spacious, like after Bruna's exercise today, Eileen said, and Kimi both said, I feel more joyful, I feel more spacious, I'm more aware. And 
And when that happens, when our when that happens with our clients and our patients, when they feel more like they're more up over their pelvis, when they start feeling like, as one of my patients says, I expected you to make my hip feel better, but I never expected you to help me to feel more at one with myself. And boy, that took me by surprise. And I thought, more at one with myself. <laughs> and the more I started doing this work, the more I realized there's something happening here metabolically and especially in terms of interoception, the somatic awareness, emotional somatic awareness that is, is more relaxing and more safe, especially with the patients with trauma. Um, that we work with, that when they feel safe and they feel that they can be heard and, and they, they're they listened to, and then we work with their bodies, not forcing anything, but listening carefully to what the patients are expressing and what the bodies are expressing, then the changes that come about are um, so much more powerful than doing the repetition of the exercises that, that we were taught. So basically, I gave you a little bit of a, of a breakdown of what we offer in our course for PTs and now OTs and PT assistants and OT assistants um, online. Carol, uh, and students. I got the question if we were accepting students. PT uh, and OT students. PTs, yeah. Right. Okay, great. Um, so, and the next course starts on April the 9th, and it's, and the website for that is www.biotensegritiphysio.com. And um, you can sign up and become a part of that class. But I'm going to turn it over now to Eileen, whose hand is raised, and I'm glad to yield. So Eileen, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that that safety is really important. We keep that in mind with our clients, and we need to keep that in mind when we're talking to other people about biotensegrity so that they say, feel safe hearing from us about something that uh, is asking them to really shift their mind and let go of a lot of what they know. And I know I've heard Susan say that when she first was acquainted, she was like shouting it from the rooftops and expecting everybody to like hear it. And I felt that way too. Um, and, and, and fortunately, um, I was always viewed as kind of out on the fringe uh, in the physical therapy community. And I felt like I was entitled to share this information, uh, but with the attitude that I leave people in freedom to decide if they wanna pursue that. And we're all here out of our own free will joining this. And I think we need to keep that in mind when we're, that's another challenge of early adopters, I think, is um, um, being a little too evangelistic. Yeah, the eye rolls that we get. Oh, here she goes again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Let's, let's open it up now for discussion. And some of you who have questions, some of you who have comments about what you've heard, um, uh, so uh, please join us. Dawn, why don't you just unmute yourself and say what you're writing in the chat, Dawn Nance. Dawn, are you ready to come on camera and unmute, unmute yourself? Hold on, hold on. Can she unmute? We're finding it. Hold on, hold on. Oh, I think that's it. Here okay, she is. Is Hi, yes. Hi, Carol. Um, thanks for inviting me. This is actually my first Zoom meeting. I am <laughs> much more esoteric than I am computer tech savvy. So but well, I have, enjoyed, I have enjoyed this today. I had to have my husband set it up for me because <laughs> I haven't done this before. But I love that both of you mentioned the concept of safety. Um, I learned from Reggie Beam 30 years ago because she had polio. I know many of you probably know her in the field um, as having beam workshops, worked with the Bobass and that type of stuff for NDT training. And she, you know, really instilled in me in 1994, introduced me to John Barnes' work, 
but also the concept of safety that a kid, a patient, anyone can feel a therapist coming from a mile away if they have an intention or they have a right. bias or they have an agenda, right? So this concept of connecting through safety for me is like the most important thing you can offer your patient, your client, your friend, your mother, you know, right? In any connection that you have with another person. So I just think this is wonderful. Um, all the work that all of you have done uh, coming from a background <clears throat> of sensory integration, you know, NDT, some pediatrics, some orthopedic, um, just all of this basically. You know, that the fact that it's all one system and that we're all part of a bigger whole um, and how we, can we connect into that through safety and actual nourishment, right, to this system. Because I feel like that the consciousness that flows through the microtubules and uh, the mind aspect of it, I believe, as you do, Carol, you know, that we're working with someone's mind, body in a holistic way. And that I love, I can't remember everyone's name, um, but whomever spoke about, um, you know, not, uh, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> I'm not used to being on, on a camera where people are watching me. Um, you're doing fine. But the person, the person that spoke about um, not wanting to come in and uh, let necessarily like change the system or that it's not broken, right? Mm -hmm. That we're always striving for homeostasis in, in a sense and that we're all striving for providing the most, the, the body and the brain are kind of lazy, right? You know, we're always trying to search for the most efficient way to get this whole process of existence of being done. And so to be careful with our words, not to say, oh, well, you have these blockages or imbalances or, you know, that type of thing going on in your body uh, or in your mind body. Um, I mean, you're perfect exactly as you are and you're exactly where you are because of a, you know, a sequence of events or life experiences, uh, environmental input that brings you exactly to where you are, right? And so for any of us to expand from that place is to really appreciate, you know, what got us here. Um, but then also to be able to kind of unwind or unravel or unfold some of these things has to be done in a permissive environment, right? Um, and the only way I think that clients give us permission to enter their field is through that sense of safety. Great. So Great that comments. would be my. Thank you. My, you had your <laughs> debut. Your debut was very successful. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's good to see you, Carol. Good to see you, Bob. Okay. Yes, so Fiona. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just a couple of things, but one is, I think the safety thing keeps coming up. And my understanding is that the Stephen Porges of the polyvagal theory explains it best that if you can provide the safe space for a person so that they can come into a more parasympathetic state, it's in that parasympathetic state in which the body does its self-healing. And in the end of the day, none of us heal anybody except ourselves. However, we can facilitate other people's healing by first of all, providing that safe space. Um, and that's the, the sacredness of it in a sense and the privilege we have and it, it also I also wanted to mention that in, in my understanding of our growing understanding of this the compression and tensegrity part or tension part that um, I think Maria's demonstration with the horse is probably the best way of describing that the lighter the touch the more profound can be the effect on the whole system and what this is doing is really helping to explain it for our left brains what we're feeling through our hands and seeing our patients see as well. And I just absolutely fascinates me. So thank you everyone. And I just I have one question, which I'm hoping somebody may be able to help me to understand better. Um, a, a functional medicine lady that I know recently told me she heard someone speak about um, fascial tunnels because the, the system obviously is this compression and tension, but it also needs fluid like oil to help things to move freely. So, but apparently the when the lymph gets full or the lymph nodes are full, some little um, cell burrows and makes a tunnel into the fascia to offload the excess toxins it can't deal with. And this is weakening the fascial system, which is that weakening that all that 
compression and tension system. I'd love to understand more about it. So if anybody has any links or anything to help me, I'd be really appreciated. And thank you all. It's been amazing. Okay, Fiona, thank you. Um, there, that's an, an interesting concept about tunneling. And we saw some of that at the Fascia Research Congress last year at uh, in, in uh, Montreal. Um, I don't think we can go into it today, but I think that there is some research indicating that um, fascia does, um, especially the um, the, uh, the 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 area of fascia around organs, um, has is open to being tunneled by um, tumor cells, and so um, uh, we don't have uh, we don't have time to go into that today, Fiona. But um, um, maybe somebody can put in the in the uh, chat where we might find some more information about that. Okay, um, Anna Kroll, welcome from Britain. Nice to see you. You you're not gonna you're not gonna speak, or do you want to unmute? Yeah, there you go. I've unmuted. Yeah, thanks. Uh, nice to see you, Carol. Um, yeah, I think I just wanted to add just a comment on what you were saying, Carol, and what Eileen was saying really about uh, it. It has been hard to to try to explain biotensegrity to physios that don't know about it, don't understand about it. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and like Eileen was saying, when I first discovered biotensegrity, I just wanted to shout about it from the rooftops. And I kind of felt like I had a duty to, because there was this one particular condition, which those of you that have seen my tea party will know I had a, a lot to say about pelvic core and prolapse. And, um, and I felt like I had this duty that I had to, explain biotensegrity and basically until I was blue in the face and I explained it and explained it explained it and explained it until I was blue in the face and actually sort of underneath that I was also battling to get over long COVID and mm. I actually I realized after a while that that battle that I must explain this to everyone because it's so important that people absolutely have to wake up and it was when I realized that that was detrimental to my own health really that right, I right. just taken a, a really big step back a really big step back and you know I've been coming to the stuff but just kind of lurking a lot and <laughs> and for now I'm not working in pelvic health and I'm, I'm and I'm following a lot of Mariana's world because I'm I've, I'm looking at a lot of Mariana's stuff because I, I'm now working with kids and just trying to do something completely different um but yeah I just wanted to right. add yeah. what was being said about a recognition of how hard it is to to try to explain to physios who don't get it how well there's so it is. much misinformation about pelvic floor and what women should do especially isn't there isn't there just yeah and and your your tea party and and susan if you could put up uh, anna kroll's tea party on pelvic floor where she goes through her she becomes the pelvis <laughs> she's jumping up and down and trying to explain that this is a i already put it in the, the it's already in the chat Wonderful. This is a this is a tension compression issue. It's not doing tensing already tense muscles by doing Kegel exercises is not going to fix the problem. Yeah. And, and in fact, it just makes so many people so much worse. And this is I just got so I was so stuck in that all day, every day. Every, yeah. It was it was overtaking me. I was like, I yeah. have to just get everyone to stop. And well, your use of models and, and metaphor and, and so forth is so helpful. And so I want to I want to send everybody there to look at that marvelous tea party with, with, um, um, with Anna explaining all this beautifully. So it's nice to see you. Welcome back to the fold, Anna. <laughs> and from and from from, from the bottom part, the top part of Great Britain, Fiona, from Edinburgh, Fiona Webster. Hello, Carol. Yes, Hello. I'm here in Scotland. Um. It's been wonderful these last few hours and I wanted to just bring back the kind of, for me personally, this focus on biot integrity ideas mm -hmm. that I've been sharing and discussing and had the privilege of joining in on some of these meetings over the last few years. And really, whether it's, you know, working on your own little models that you can experiment with to get back to the actual principles. It feeds into absolutely every single element of therapy. And that's going 
we know that the the resonance that, that we have the 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 principles of the push pull the uh attraction repulsion all those universal laws of um integrity going into bite integrity and how we can really think about therapy in the broader sense i started teaching i'm a so i'm a sports therapist and i do uh, sports injuries and uh manual movement therapy and i'm a yoga teacher for 10 years but also i started teaching breathwork classes and of course it's exact you know it's very easy to look at kind of different therapies as if they're kind of a different mode of bringing a different way of working and it's all ex it's exact when you look at biotensegrity and you know Stephen Levin has been able to bring this the, these ideas together that that feed into all of that so the breath work is exactly the same movement it's the it's the same attraction repulsion the the, the compression uh elements that that you can look into just the these models and play with things that um just make it so powerful and uh carol was mentioned mentioning also about uh neil tease and all these other fantastic experts that it all comes into this these principles uh you can see how those laws work together and it's so it's so immensely powerful that we all feel drawn to this and and able to share it and and continue to do so so thank you so much yeah you're welcome and thank you, Fiona. It's good to see you again. Okay, Mariana, yes, you're next. Like, I think all of us, we wanted to share this like as loud as possible and we all hit the wall. At, well, I keep doing it many times, right? And I say, okay, this is not the way. I, how can I go softer? How can I put it in a way? But it's especially with the kids and the therapies of the kids. When I say don't stretch the doctor because the doctor is helping, they go like, ah, what do you mean? So, but I, I really want to, to just take a deep breath here. And right now we are a hundred, no, we are 53 per persons connected here. And we, we, we went all the way up to 90 and we had 173 registration, 79 registration. We had never, we could have, this is a, my English does never work. We never could imagine this happening like, like it's happening today. I remember about two years ago or three years ago, I had a meeting with Dr. Levin because I was really confused about the muscle, how the muscles work and the muscles don't contract. And I still don't get it, but the muscles don't contract. And I remember in that meeting, I told him like, listen, I, I dream about, sharing this with more and more physiotherapists because and and he said okay good that's what you have to do then and we had already our pity pot that's how we call ourselves the pity pot and that pity pot honestly we were four when we started and then carol came kimi came and then we we ended up being we're now eight or well, seven plus pedro we love you pedro and now look that from that pity pot pity pot now we have this and and I, what I do want to invite, beside the course and beside whatever, like all the resources, I'm going to save the chat and I'm going to send those links, all of the links that have been shown there. I'm going to share that with you so you have it, okay? But I think what what is what I really want to bring back to the point is what the big, the biotensegrity interest group means. Because when I asked Susan, the first one I did was the Spanish one. And I asked Susan, what are the guidelines? What do I have to do? And she said, nothing. You just get together and you talk about what's integrity. That's all. And that's exactly what we did today. We just, okay, who wants to talk? Who can present something? Okay, let's put together. And, and that's what we did. But I can, I can imagine in the future, as more and more professionals come and join the movement, uh, that we're going to have more bigs and Maybe there's going to be bigs that we won't all be part of because we're so busy with other bigs that we cannot just attend them all. And Im imagine what that could bring to the profession, right? And I think that we are very fortunate that, I don't know, Carol, I think it's you the one who said it, or Eileen, that this is going to happen. Like, unfortunately, can you say it, please, Carol? Because you, you have a very strong way. Like, you, you better jump in now and be 
on 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 the train uh, that to be a late like, oh why did it who said that in the group can you help me Eileen is that you who say that no Carol probably Carol probably was you what what I was getting at was this is science this is not this is not a, fa a fad this is the science of nature the foundation of life and Steve Levin found certain principles that that seem to fit this this natural natural science. Buckminster Fuller found some. Um, uh, other other people have. Uh, 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 Donald Ingber found pieces of it. The scientists are coming together with these pieces, and then we're recognizing what impact it has on the human. And then we're going back to our science that we learned and said, this makes so much more sense, but it's not going to go away any more than Newtonian science would ever go away because Newton served us very well for, for hundreds of years, but it just stops short of human beings. And when we wanna look at human beings, we have to look at life science and life science is, and the physiology of life science for me is in part biotensegrity, the principles of biotensegrity. So it's all people, everybody's going to know it and like it and, and use it. Well, I don't know whether they'll like it, but they'll use it. And little by little by little, the, the, the staunch um, advocates of Newton and biomechanics and the people who roll their eyes, they'll, they will, I don't mean to be harsh about this, but they will die. And, and then the, this whole new movement is going to come in and then other people who were rolling their eyes, if they're, if they're still with us, I'll say, oh yeah, I, I believe that all along. I believe that all along. I was just, you know, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm fine. I was waiting for it to catch on. And, and then it'll be the law of the land, so to speak, but it's all, it's still changing. We're still finding ways. As Camilla said so beautifully, there, there are times when I'll be part of a discussion, like, like Steve, Steve, you, I don't know where he went. He's kind of, it's, he's, he's still around, I bet, but Steve Levin gave me a, a chat in the chat and said, Carol, it's not really best to talk about this in terms of fixotrophy. We have to start thinking, especially in terms of bones, we have to think about something else. So now I want to go back and say, okay, now wait, fixotrophy maybe for the extracellular matrix change. But when we talk about bones, we're really talking about pressure in a different way, impact of pressure in a different way. And so I make these statements about science. And then I, I, I realize some of it is proven and some of it is hypothesis still, proposal still. So that might be what you're getting at, Mariana. Yeah, like, right? yeah, I want to say that this is happening, whether you want to say it or not. Our, yes. I want, one of the things that uh, we had this big dream when, when we first started our meetings some years ago, if we could teach physiotherapy from scratch, if we could, if we could, if we had the power and the freedom to design the curriculum for physiotherapy, how would you do? How we would do it? So that that was a, a dream that we had. Like, okay, let's let's pretend that no one is telling telling us what to teach or how to teach it. How would you do this? And that's that's a fun exercise because, uh, for example, I remember my comments. I would start with embryology because if you understand how we became who we are, you cannot put the parts away anymore. You cannot separate the parts. Mm -hmm. If you understand how we how we became humans like how we form ourselves you it's impossible to divide the body in in parts and osteology and arthrology and and you know muscles and uh, nerve it's impossible everything is just formed together right so yeah beautiful i'm very happy and honored that this happened um and again thank you pedro you're next and we're almost in the in the time to close in so whoever wants to speak raise their hand because we're getting close to the end. <laughs> Raise the hand so we know uh, how many people we have like uh, in the line and want to share something. Um, what I want to share is that, um, so two things that came to my mind. Someone uh, was saying about, um, um, how is it called? So parasympathetic, you know, tone and the polyvagal theory that it helps explain you know healing process and this is this was a very nice thing and in my point of view 
this is a little as, as far as i understand it's great and it comes a little more from like the neurological point of view which is great or maybe psychological as well which is great and but at the same time we that work with you know with the hands and 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 moving tissues and with touch basically we have i i feel in biotensegrity a way to understand a different way which is which comes together but different way to you know to go into the system so to speak i like to think like that and something else happens yes there is that part of the neurological but something else happens when you go into the system using this you know these principles and and um and i think it helps a lot our our like our, our, our the way i think the way i feel uh, our work it to me it feels like it's not like a lateral lateral door it's like an entire gate that we have to work um to help in this healing process and this that we're talking here the whole whole afternoon or the whole day gives us more structure more understanding more tools to understand how to work on this how to work with the structure how to work with behavior of the structure to you know engage and produce this movements of the system in directions to healing to you know self-maintaining to health um and the other thing that i want to say is that um get engaged in the community somehow because we all go through this when you start to see you know you think differently from like the mainstream it's very hard to be to feel alone i mean to fight like the the mainstream it's you know not a good idea perhaps but join join the community um somehow there is now people like-minded uh the uh, enough like we're, we're we're some united here gather here we have some resources right so there is the the archive when you have where you have many, many uh, free materials. And I strongly advise you to, you know, choose one thing that you like and their long uh, meetings and watch one or two. You will find probably things that will resonate. And uh, there's this other, uh, the, the other community from, from Chris, the Embodied Biotensegrity. Uh, we're putting on the, on, uh, the new group of the, the course for physiotherapists, which is more applied, is more direct to how do we apply this on a more practical way, the principles of biotensegrity in the field of physical therapy. There are many ways to engage. Get engaged uh, so that you feel, many people talked about this today, that you feel that you're not alone. Maybe there's not someone like in your area, in your neighborhood, but in the world, you will find people that think like you and uh, will you feel strength. So, thank you, Pedro. That was helpful. Great. And Cindy Hodgson, you want to sneak in quick before we have to close out? Yes, thank you, Carol. I just wanted to share. I really do believe that the environment is changing. Last month, I did a continuing education two hour course for a local hospital and 45 PTs and OTs showed up and the director was very surprised that there was that much interest, first of all, because she she doesn't usually have that that many. And then in the first few minutes, I, I asked everyone to by raise of hands who was familiar with the term biotensegrity. And I was shocked when no one raised their hand out of 45 clinicians, you know, and it was just, it was an exciting presentation. I had so much fun doing it and they all received it really well. They loved it. I had many people come up later and I was asked to come back, you know, can you show us more? Cause all I did was a, a presentation, you know, with slides showing them what this was about, like how this paradigm shift and so on. And I didn't talk about techniques or anything. So now they, they want more. And I just find that very encouraging. So what you guys are doing is really working and I'm so happy to be a part of it. And I just wanted to share that. Wonderful. Thank you, Cindy, very much. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over now to Mariana to have some closing comments and any announcements that you need to make. And I wanna thank everybody, especially 
um, Steve Levin and Susan Lowell for coming today. Um, and, and Graham as well, Graham Scar, our, our mentors in this process. And um, uh, Susan has been very helpful on the chat in, in sh and connecting you with resources that the archive has available for your learning. And um, with that, I'll just say, take it over, Mariana. Thank you, Carl. Well, um, what to do next? It's it it's up to you. What you want to do? And like we are inviting, of course, to a new course. We just love it. It it we're doing it from our heart. It's a very, I would say, affordable, fair course uh, that we're just there to support you and to to help you in a way transit the journey that we've been transiting for so many years in a shorter amount of time kind of way and it's it's very fun so you are more than welcome the links again uh, you will have them in an email but there's also in the chat and just to give you an idea how the course work we meet once a month it's now this new cohort it's going to be every third like the third friday of every month we meet uh, usually at 12 eastern time and it's one hour and a half. So in the first half, we we talk about the concept that we're talking that month, and then we we have discussions, conversations. Okay, so that happens. So the course it's and it's it's recorded. It's all we have a platform where the course live, and there's also a community there. We we can talk, you know, chat with each other later. Uh, we we share resources. There's a lot of experientials that we do as homework. So it's a fun and easy and easy. Um, how you say that? Like an easy pace course. Okay, we're gonna start on April nineteenth. The archive. Please go and check the archive information. Um, there's a lot there, and two things. If you subscribe to their newsletter, and you will find that the, the moment you you check, Pedro, yeah, Pedro, can you help me also with the um, the other links? You have them or not? Not. not. <laughs> Or maybe Susan put the archive there. My mistake. I should have done this properly, but I I, I for, completely forgot about the links. Okay, it's okay. If not, I'll send them by email. So the Very archive, good. yeah, they have the tea parties or the meetings that we do. Not meetings. That every it is not it's not fixed, but very often we have tea parties, biotensory tea parties, or there are series. For example, there was a beautiful series of videos with Leonid interviewing Dr. Levin, how he started all this. That's a beautiful thing. And all that is free and is in YouTube, on YouTube. So you can, that's going to give you like a month of work just going through those videos, but it's fun. Um, then Chris's platform, Chris, say hi, Chris, so everybody knows who you are. Yes, the Embody by Integrity. It's a beautiful community as well to learn. And this is where you get to hang out with the, the guys. Uh, Dr. Levin is always there. Susan is always there. Like Graham and and they invite like I, I don't know. Like the other day you had, um, my goodness, help me the embryo, yeah, Vanderbilt, yeah, yep, exactly. So you it it's really a good place to be, and it's a different it's a different way of learning, but a beautiful one. Um, and she has, she also has a free trial, right, Chris, for the for your. Yeah, so I'm gonna also send that link. Yeah, yeah we, you, we put the chat in. I will put it in the chat, Pedro. Yeah, can you can you quickly explain what that is so they know? Why don't I invite Gwen too, since Gwen is the other part of the team? Is she here, Gwen? Down there, and oh, she's in the corner of my screen. No, let me find her, Gwen. There she is. Thanks, <laughs> Mariana. Way to put me on the spot there. <laughs> Uh, no, we are a community of people who, much like today, we just love to get together and geek out on on everything biotensegrity and how it relates to whatever it is that we're doing in life. So uh, we have three Zoom calls a month. Each one of those are recorded, so they are in our archives, so you have access to them whether you come to the call or not. Um, and then we have a whole free platform as well, which ha has all kinds of resources and different things as well. So it's a it's a really fun, supportive community. And then the guest pass is um, 
basically good until April to 15th. So you'll be able to come and see everything that's inside of uh, the Trailblazers uh, as a guest for, for that for that month. So that that's there for you. And since I have the ability to unmute myself, uh, Mariana, Camilla, Carol, Eileen, all of you, I just want to say how fabulous this has been and how lucky I feel to be part of this community. Every time I hear you speak, I learn something new. And I just want to say I'm learning about biotensegrity, the different insights you bring the different way that you have of approaching these things open up new doors for me. And I'm also learning about sharing. So thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Grace, you, you are you are the one who started this because because of you as well, how we met. <laughs> like the group, right? So good to you as well. Okay, so listen, and one more thing. Um, Dr. Levin had his hand up too. He did? No, no, I don't think just, he did. No, he was he was clapping. I think he was clapping. Yeah, no, so no, that's okay. the other thing. We are uh, an email away. We are like, um, some of us use more social media than others. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, if you want quest, like have questions, like we, we try to give as much support as we can, um, or at least guide you in the direction that we should, we can help you, okay? So- yeah, fabulous. Thank you, everyone. I don't know, the team, the PT pod, come up and say at least. <laughs> Good to thank you, Fernando and Stacey. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So thank grateful. you for joining everybody. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. And give me a, a couple of days to put all the information together. I, sh I should say give us because it's not me only. We are a team and we're working very hard, okay? To put all the links together and everything and send the recording as well. Um, and then all the all the links that were shared in the in the chat. Okay, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks everyone. Okay, I'm stuck.